I was okay, thinking... how are we doing with the board member attendance here? I got one. Hello, thinking... everyone. Lori, I was thinking also from Greg Mosier's standpoint to do it earlier than later. Um, I don't know if he's, there he is. And he, he's connected right now. So right. maybe in terms of the board reports would be the most economical for his time. Yeah, good idea. Well, we can, uh, if it's all right with everyone, then we can ask JC to present on the outreach during the board reports. And uh, Greg could field any questions at that time. Yeah. Good morning, Greg. Good morning. Sorry, I just had to turn the mute off. Okay. And uh, Jeff, for, uh, good morning. I don't see our new uh, board member, uh, Laverne Lewis, or uh, Keith on yet. <laughs> I'm missing them. I don't see them yet. I got Laverne. Hold on. Good. I'll give another minute for uh, Director Edwards to come in. If we don't, uh, we don't see him. I'll start the public forum. Okay. Is is Kathy on? Oh, I don't see her either. Thank you. And Bruce, we are up to eight raised hands. Yeah, I'm I'm seeing I got a note from uh, Kathy that says she can't log in from WebEx. I had a little problem on my computer also this morning, so I'm doing it from my personal computer rather than the TriMet uh, PC mm -hmm. or uh, iPad. Lori had some difficulty this morning too. Maybe right. uh, it, it was a different login screen today. Oh, interesting. Okay. Well, maybe uh, Kimberly could call Kathy and see if uh, we can help her get in here. Or we could ask her to participate by phone until we get that figured out. Uh, yes, I'm happy to do that. And I've also spoken with Keith <clears throat> working on resolving his issue. Okay. Sorry, folks, for the delay. We'll get to you in just a minute here. <clears throat> Technology is great when it works.
Oh, good. I'm in the right meeting. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> good morning, uh, Director Gonzalez. Good morning, President Warner. Well, I, I know that the staff is working with our uh, <clears throat> with both uh, Director Edwards and Way to, to try to figure out how to get them get in here. But I think we ought not delay the public forum or uh, we will uh, be here uh, for a longer time than, than I think many of us have available here this morning. So what I'm going to do is uh, start with the uh, begin the public forum and for anybody who's not uh, participated uh, before with the board, this is an opportunity we provide 45 minutes before every uh, minute or before every <laughs> meeting. Uh, to allow individuals to comment on items that are on the uh, uh, board uh, agenda today or other issues of concern with TriMet. Uh, the individuals are limited to two or three uh, minutes. I understand, Jeff, we're around eight. Is that what we have this morning? Uh, yes, we have nine. We have nine. With nine, we should be able to give everybody a full three minutes and allow everybody the, the, the time to participate. So I'll ask uh, Jeff uh, to help us make monitor that timing. Uh, the, uh, the, for anybody wanting to know about the public forum uh, is, is uh, available for folks to call in here and I think you just realize it's fairly simple for them to provide the testimony. Uh, if uh, people want to provide information to the board uh, uh, that's longer than three minutes, uh, we'd, we would encourage you to send any testimony to uh, board testimony at trimet.org and I would note that we have received a number of uh, uh, messages that, that were included in our packet from individuals dealing with union negotiations with uh, the ch transit line changes that the uh, route changes that we have on the agenda later and i will also point out for anybody who wants to talk about the line changes uh, the route changes we have later on the agenda this is our first reading of an ordinance today and i will also open a public hearing on that specific issue if you want to wait around uh, to get to hear the, the staff report before you actually make uh, testimony. So with that, I'm going to go to the uh, first person, Jeff, if you would call on him, please, and open their uh, their mic. Uh, yeah, the first person I have is Doug Allen. And first, I have a timer for us today. Can you okay, verify you, you. you see it? Can you see that? I don't. Oh. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I have to turn the video back on. There's no timer slide. Can you see that now? Yes. Perfect. Okay. So I'll reset that. All right. Uh, Doug, I am unmuting your mic. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, President Warner and directors, and welcome new director, Dr. Lewis. Uh, my testimony relates to the Ordinance 363, the route changes, but I'd like to give my testimony now, and that way perhaps the staff presentation could respond to some of my some of my Thank testimony. You. Thank you, Doug. That's very helpful. Uh, yes. Yeah, so my name is Doug Allen, and I'm testifying today regarding Ordinance 363. I object to the decommissioning of the Hollywood Transit Center and the removal of lines 66, 75, and 77. As a member of the Banfield Transitway Citizens Advisory Committee, which advised the planning of the original light rail line in this region, I am aware of the thought and consideration that went into developing the Hollywood Transit Center as a convenient transfer location for passengers. Among those considerations was eliminating the need for transferring passengers to cross streets with heavy traffic. The final design of the Hollywood Transit Center involved various compromises, including lack of an elevator up to the level of the pedestrian bridge that accesses the MAC station. Unfortunately, Primat has now chosen not to address that problem with an elevator or a ramp for buses, but to make transfers more difficult and hazardous by removing buses entirely from the transit center, making it a non-transit center. Ordinance 363 Exhibit A is unclear and possibly misleading as it claims that line 75 will be served on Halsey. The map on TriMet's website shows the southbound stop to be on Northeast 42nd Avenue, not Halsey. And while it shows a stop for northbound line 75 service, on eastbound Halsey, the location prior to a left turn seems highly questionable. You may not know that currently TriMet has a restroom facility for bus operators in the transit center. 
Additionally, because line 75 in particular has schedule reliability problems due to its length, a bit of extra time in the schedules allows buses that arrive ahead of schedule to pause briefly so that they depart on time. This will not be possible for buses that stop on 42nd or Halsey, and bus operators will lose the restroom opportunity. Also, the discussion of Title VI equity analysis refers to a Title VI service equity analysis report, but that report isn't available among the materials for this meeting shown on the TriMet website. Furthermore, the discussion seems to have nothing to do with Ordinance 363 and instead refers to Ordinance 359 from March 2020, and it refers to Line 47, which isn't among the routes changed by Ordinance 363. In any case, any analysis of the changes to Lines 66, 75, and 77 would show that they negatively affect your riders. I urge you to reject these changes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doug. I appreciate your thoughtful uh, testimony, and maybe staff can respond to that when we get into the ordinance. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, Jeff. Okay, next is Jemaine Gibson. Jemaine, you are unmuted. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. My name is Jemaine Gibson. I am the Workforce Development Coordinator for the Amalgamated Transit Union. Uh, office, uh, International Office in Washington, uh, D.C. Today, I will be discussing the apprenticeship programs at TriMet and a possible solution to help them continue and, and even improve them. Registered apprenticeship programs are growing in popularity across the United States and with good reason. Since these programs benefit the workers and transit agencies, employees learn necessary skills while earning a paycheck and employers develop a staff of qualified workers trained to their specific specifications. Uh, the US Department of Labor on Friday announced the availability of approximately 87.5 million for states to expand and diversify their registered apprenticeship programs, like the ones that you have at TriMet. The State Apprenticeship Expansion, Equity and Innovation, SAEEI grants could be a game changer for TriMet apprenticeship programs. These grants are designed to expand systems to support the development, modernization, and diversification of registered apprenticeship programs. They're also geared to improve labor management partnerships and, pro and promote innovation in program development and recruitment strategies, all important goals to the ATU. During the co course of our collective bargaining session with TriMet, the agency has continually raised cost issues with apprenticeship programs. This grant could easily fill some of the funding gaps and help transform this program for the future. Apprenticeship programs are extremely valuable to the members at TriMet and across the country. This is a, the apprenticeship programs are designed to help us continue to gain skills and continue to uh, climb the career ladder. We strongly urge the board um, to take a different position and, and support continuing the apprenticeship programs that you have at TriMet. Again, they're one of the longest running in the country. You've had programs registered since the 80s. You've graduated over 700 apprentices uh, in your different classifications. And we strongly encourage the board to support the continuing of the apprenticeship programs at TriMet. Thank you. Thank you, Jermaine. I appreciate your comments. Jeff, next on the list. Okay, next on the list is Bill Bradley. Bill, you're unmuted. Thank you, Jeff. Board President Warner, assembled members of the TriMet board, uh, Mr. Sam DeSue, TriMet staff, and the listening public. My name is Bill Bradley, and I'm executive board officer with ATU 757. I wanna start my testimony by acknowledging the members of the TriMet board that responded to my outreach. My team and I enjoyed our conversations with you, and we hope that you found the conversation productive and informative. I also want to continue to extend my offer to the couple of board members here that have not yet made the connection with us. My team and I are still looking forward to speaking with you directly. Board President Warren, I must respond to your March 17th email response to my outreach. This response was so full of blame shifting, disinformation, and lies that it could only have been written by an individual intoxicated on the TriMet Kool-Aid, an individual that actually mixes the batches himself. I have seen this language before. Your lead negotiator, Laird Cusack, has used this uh, language with Governor Brown, Congressman Blumenauer, Congressman DeFazio, and others. 
Bruce, it's truly an embarrassment that you would allow yourself to be used as a sock puppet to spread Laird Cusack's myopic view of hardworking TriMet employees. The before mentioned leaders were right when they saw through this language by meeting with TriMet staff and ATU separately. They wrote letters supporting TriMet's registered apprenticeship programs to this board and to Mr. Sanders. Bruce, I implore you to meet with the ATU. There are significant details that you are missing from your understanding, and I cannot cover them in the three minutes allotted today. Yesterday, I had the pleasure to testify in front of the Oregon Joint Committee on Transportation to discuss apprenticeships. I also was able to hear TriMet testify, but I could not believe what I heard. I heard subtle insinuations that AT was wanting to continue the programs as they are, which according to TriMet have barriers built in that prevent diversity. Let me put on the record, AT believes in promoting diversity and increasing equity full stop. We will work tirelessly to achieve these outcomes. TriMet is solely responsible for hiring. Half of each class of apprenticeships are hired from outside of TriMet. The other half are filled with current TriMet service workers, which again, TriMet hired to be service workers. If the board is unsatisfied with diversity and equity metrics, hold TriMet management accountable. Do not take it out on the workers. I also heard TriMet claim graduating apprenticeships are afraid of cold wind, that TriMet apprenticeships uh, do not know what a wrench is. All these comments disparaging their own workforce. It's unbecoming. ATU has heard various shifting arguments from TriMet staff as to why they think the apprenticeships must be shut down. One argument was diversity. Even after Oregon Labor Commissioner Val Hoyle testified to this board in December 2019 that, quote, TriMet's apprenticeship programs are among the most diverse in the state of Oregon, unquote. TriMet, in, you know, um, let's see. TriMet has raised costs even after ATU, working with transit agencies apart, uh, partners across the state, lobby to allow stiff dollars to be used to preserve service and programs in the spring of 2020. While we did not work with directly with TriMet on this initiative, TriMet has indicated it would use $40 million of stiff funds to this end. The federal government has also pledged over $370 million to TriMet in response to COVID-19. President Biden's American Rescue Plan will further push this federal relief to over half a billion dollars. Let me say that again. TriMet will have received over a half a billion dollars on top of their regular federal funds in the last year. Costs cannot be the issue. But if it's training costs specifically, ATU has you covered there as well. The U.S. Department of Labor has announced a new opportunity, the State Apprenticeship Expansion, Equity, and Innovation Grants. This grant can potentially bring in $10 million of federal funds to modernize these programs, fix the problems identified in the TRC engineering report, a report that TriMet paid over six figures for, then buried when it did not serve their narrative. TriMet Mr. did not show the results with ATU up, for over six months. We bargained over these apprenticeships. Back to this game-changing grant opportunity, Bully wants to apply for these funds for TriMet, but TriMet must commit to continuing these programs. The deadline is tight. Applications for this grant must be in by April 26th. Mr. Bradley, I'm going to have to can make this happen. Please. Put a motion on the floor directing. Thank you. Jeff, I could, if I could go to the next speaker, please. Yes, next up is Jim Howell. Jim, you're on mute. Uh, Chairman Warner, board directors. My um, name is Jim Howell. I'm here speaking for AORTA, the Association of Oregon Rail and Transit Advocates. AORTA opposes the Better Red Project and outlines below a viable alternative. Number one, cease work and spending on Better Red except for adding a second track at the airport. Number two, operate the red line 24 hours a day, every day. Three, during the day, operate the red line between the airport and Gateway Transit Center only. At night, operate it between the airport and PSU via downtown transit mall. Four, extend the yellow line to Hatfield Center in Hillsboro via the downtown Yamhill Morris alignment. And five, through route the green and orange lines on the downtown transit mall. Now, here are some advantages of this proposal over better red. It saves up to $200 million of public money by avoiding unnecessary construction. It provides all night direct service to downtown Portland and bus, better bus uh, rail connections from the airport to East Multnomah County and to Clackamas County. The red line will have little impact on the schedule of the rest of the MAC systems. The red line does not cross the steel bridge during day and peak hours, freeing up slots for peak service, off-schedule trains, and increased service on other lines. It reduces rail traffic on the steel bridge, allowing all lines to be upgraded to 12-minute frequency. It does not require adding track, 
switches, signals, and operator brake facilities at the Fair Complex Hillsborough uh, Max Station. It doubles Max service to downtown Hillsborough and connects with buses to Cornelius Forest Grove, as well as providing faster single seat service to and from North Portland. And it provides better and it provides better transit service between Clark County and Washington County with the Max T C uh, Tran connection at Delta Park. Uh, and that's uh, it summarize my testimony. Thank you, Jim. I will point out we do have a, a I think a copy of your written testimony in our packets today too. Appreciate your time coming in this morning. I also yeah. have some graphics with that. I'm sorry, Jim, what was that? I, I included some graphics with what I sent to you. I can't obviously show it to you here. Great, okay, thank you very much. Jeff, you wanna go on to the next speaker? Okay, next speaker is Brett Horner. Brett, you are unmuted. Brett, are you there? Brett, I'm going to try and unmute you one more time. I uh, don't think we can get Brett's audio, unfortunately. Okay. Maybe you can sign back in and we can get back to him if he comes back. Okay. All right, let's go on to the next one then. Okay, next up is Shirley Block. Shirley, you're unmuted. Good morning, President Warner and Trivet Board. I've been coming here for over a year and I want to speak on the apprenticeship program. I too was in that uh, legislative meeting yesterday and I was totally disappointed in TriMet's response about the apprenticeship program and how uh, it, it literally embarrassed the employees, how they feel that they are not smart enough to do the job, they can't be trained or they flip around from job to job, which is not true. We sell that in the last contract and you fail to uh, admit that. We have been working and asking and we had politicians sending letters to you to try to improve the apprenticeship program. We will, we're here to help. You shouldn't throw it out and just say no to it. You need to give your employees the opportunity to move up on the job. Don't disrespect your employees. As one person cannot run TriMet, especially one person who has been kicked out of other organizations and you have brought a bit here to destroy your employees. The morale around this company is in the toilet. It can be fixed. You have people here that are willing to leave. Not only are union people leaving, management people are leaving, and that is for a reason. And I know, President Warner, you are on your way out to a happy land someplace else, but do not destroy this company. Do not allow this one individual to throw the apprenticeship program out the door because we know and you know we that the federal government has given you grants if you apply for them, do the bowling oversight. And I don't know why you don't insist on fixing this. There's, I've gone, gone to Doug Kelsey, tried to talk to him about this. I've sat down with Sam and talked to him about it. Have somebody, get the new director that's coming in, have them to have a relationship with ATU. Labor and company is supposed to be working together for the community and the employees. What you are allowing to happen right now is an insult. I've been 44 years at TriMet. And this is the worst it's been for the employees and the community. Don't be ashamed. Take the oversight from Bowley. That's where the safety comes into this program. You need safe vehicles out there for the public to ride on. We shouldn't be fighting over safety. And that's exactly what we're fighting over. We want oversight and safety on these vehicles. You got this apprenticeship program, you're switching over to electric buses, train your employees, give them a pathway. That's all that we are asking for. Come to the table, sit down and, and negotiate with us. Talk to us like we have common sense and we're in it together. And that's what we should be in this together, not your way and my way or the highway. That has to stop. That really has to stop. Thank you for your time. 
Thank you, Shirley. Uh, and I agree with that we need to work together. I, I, I'm going to ask uh, our uh, interim general manager to give us an update of where we are, are on the labor negotiations, and I may have some comments on that when we're done here, too. Jeff, next next speaker. Okay, next up is Tristan Isaac. Tristan, you're unmuted. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Yes. Awesome. Um, well, first off, well, my name is Tristan. Um, I'm here representing Bus Riders Unite. And I wanted to start off by saying that Bus Riders Unite stands in solidarity with Amalgamated Transit Union 757 in their fight for a fair contract. Um, the rest of my testimony is going to be kind of off the cuff, so bear with me here a little bit. Um, uh, for the past few years, there's, there's been a, a bill or a series of bills, I should say, in the, in the legislature. Uh, the most recent iteration is known as HB 2482, the Equitable Transit Access Bill. Um, among other things, it proposes to eliminate um, police officers' ability to enforce fare. Um, and I was really surprised to see TriMet uh, turning out now two years in a row to lobby against this bill. Um, seeing as they uh, have insisted time and time again that police officers don't uh, perform fair enforcement and that they're not allowed to perform fair enforcement. Uh, for a little background, this bill came about as a result of a certain incident several months back, or several years back, I should say, uh, where a certain uh, community leader was was detained on transit over fare that they had actually paid. They had a monthly pass. They even had a a validated uh, digital pass on their phone, but they were still detained by fair enforcement, which then escalated to an intervention with the police who um, asked them for their name. Um, and eventually this person was was detained and charged with uh, furnishing false information. And again, you know, as a result of, of that incident, TriMet, you know, committed to uh, various measures to sort of decouple their fair enforcement from police involvement. And so, I, I just, I don't, I can't quite find the onion here. Like if TriMet, as they have insisted, don't want or don't have police officers performing fair enforcement, why then are we, are they turning out lobbyists to lobby against this bill? Like if that's what y'all want, like let's, let's do it. Let's make it official. Let's, let's put a ring on it. You know what I mean? Let's fucking, let's get, let's get it. Uh, I don't, I just, I don't, I don't understand, um, like who, like who is, who are, who are TriMet's, uh, government affairs people taking their marching orders from and, and who, who authorized them to, to go to legislature and make these decisions. Um, and so I guess in closing, I would just like to see in the future, uh, maybe less lobbying on TriMet's part against uh, legislation that protects people's civil rights and maybe more lobbying for uh, maybe busting up the highway trust fund and getting more money for transit and other sorts of things that would lead us towards the uh, fareless transit system that we all deserve. Thank you. Thank you, Tristan. Jeff? Jeff, do we have a next speaker? I think we've lost Jeff now. I apologize, I was on mute. Uh, Christy Wedig is next, and Christy, your mic is unmuted. Oh, thank you. My name is Christy Wedig. Good morning to everyone. And I live in the Arlington Heights neighborhood, and I'm testifying about um, the change in bus 63. Uh, the Arlington Heights Neighborhood Association strongly opposes the proposal for bus line 63. Uh, we would support this proposal with a modification. The, the proposal provides a better connection between the downtown transit mall and the Japanese garden, Rose Garden area, but it eliminates service to most of the neighborhood by no longer covering Southwest Fairview to the MAC station at the zoo. Explore Washington Park has stated that they will uh, propose adding service to the Arlington Heights neighborhood. However, there is no public transportation on Fairview in Arlington Heights before 10 a.m. on weekdays. That results in no morning commuter service or no morning school service for Lincoln High School students. Watch and Explore Washington Park exists mainly to service the park venues, not the public transit. It's unclear how long their shuttle would remain a long-term solution for our neighborhood. 
Please keep in mind that Arlington Heights is a steep, hilly neighborhood and walking to and from a bus stop on Kingston is totally impractical for most residents. There are several high school students that live in Arlington Heights and it is unsafe for a 14 to 17 year old girl or young boy to walk down a dark city road lined by open forests in the early morning hours to catch a bus at the bottom of the neighborhood to go to school. There are no options for students to get to school. Those that can drive can't park at Lincoln High School. TriMet is the answer for most Lincoln families. Eliminating bus service to the neighborhood will put more cars on the road due to more commuters that would love to take TriMet, take the bus to downtown uh, as they did years ago with the extended service that we had many years ago. Um, this new route will inhibit the citizens' use of TriMet. We would appreciate confirmation that, the, that TriMet has discussed the modification of the 63 line with Portland Public Schools and that the route change will not cause Portland Public Schools to be out of compliance with the student transportation guidelines that were dated in August 21st, 2009. We do have some alternatives <laughs> uh, that we have uh, that we would request you explore. One is continue the 63 line through Arlington Heights and add the downtown connection. Our ideal solution would be to have the 63 line continue through Arlington Heights neighborhood on Southwest Fairview to the Oregon Zoo Max station and add the downtown connection as proposed. Running the 63 line from the zoo to downtown would be similar to the original route that enabled many more neighbors to commute using TriMet. TriMet statistics indicate three times more neighbors and visitors used the 63 line then. Another option, route the 63 line straight up through the neighborhood and eliminate the Rose Garden circuit because that will already be served by the, um, uh, sorry, I looked at the time, uh, uh, by the Washington Park shuttle. And the third one is, is to provide something just in those early morning hours before 10 a.m for those commuters that want to go to downtown and for the um, high school students and either extend it for those couple hours or uh, provide a small commuter bus to uh, get everyone Great. where they would like to go. Thank you. Sorry. Great. Randall. Thank you. That's all right. I'm glad you learned note of the time. Thank you very much. <laughs> Jeff. Okay. Our last uh, speaker is Kurt Krager. Kurt, you're unmuted. Thank you very much. Can you hear me, Chair? We can. Excellent. Thanks so much. Uh, my name is Kurt Krieger. Good morning, Chairman Warner, members of the board. I am Executive Vice President of a nonprofit named Bridge Housing. Bridge Housing was created 38 years ago in San Francisco to help people with affordable housing and early on began developing transit oriented development in the Bay Area. Uh, in partnership with BART. Uh, some of our projects emblematic of our work include the MacArthur Station, which is in Oakland. Uh, we uh, are also underway at River Place with a two-phase project. When completed, it will be 380 affordable housing units on the Portland streetcar line. You may already know our work at the Vera, which is a 202-unit, 13-story building, which was completed in 2019, leased up, excuse me, in 2020, and leased up this last year. Um, Bridge is uh, speaking in support of uh, the route changes to 66, 75, and 77 contemplated in Ordinance 363. And I'd like to give you a quick reason why. Uh, Bridge was identified as a preferred partner by TriMet after a competitive process that contemplated the redevelopment of the Hollywood Transit Center. The Hollywood Transit Center was identified as having been now 40 years old, suffering from some obsolescence, uh, i.e. the transit platform is not fully handicapped accessible to meet current standards. The power infrastructure is now um, aged and needs replacement. And the increasing use of large long bicycles has created more and more uh, bike ped conflicts at the platform and at the, um, at the various points of transfer um, to get on and off the bus. The best practice in equitable housing and transit development is to have housing shaped by transit, transit-oriented development, which is truly integrated. And we saw this station as a way by which to achieve that. 
Uh, Portland has a lot of good examples of what I call transit adjacent development, and these would be projects that are handsome, fully functional, close to transit, convenient for riders, but they're often not shaped by transit. And that's the current best practice. So we would like to implement um, a fully equitable uh, project, about 213 units at the Hollywood Transit Center in cooperation with TriMet. Um, I must say that for those people that are worried about sort of platform changes, the design of the ramp and platform has not yet been finalized. And uh, a number of options are being examined and they will be pub fully publicly vetted. Uh, Bridge is prepared to move forward in 2021 to assemble the necessary public financing and uh, resources to build this particular project. And um, the routing of 66, 75, and 77 facilitate uh, this best practice development. I'd be happy to respond to any questions you might have. Well, thank you very much for your comments, and we look forward to seeing your proposals. Uh, I think we're excited about the redevelopment of that station. Um, Jeff, I, is, did Brett Horner ever was able to participate? Uh, let me let me go back to him. Brett, uh, are you? you? Yeah, can you hear me? We can hear you now. We, we can. Uh, yes. Great. Thank you. Um, my name is Brett Horner. I'm with Portland Parks and Recreation. Um, I just have testimony for the ordinance 363. I don't know if you want that now or later in the agenda. Please go go ahead and give it now. Okay, thank you. I'll be very brief. I'm the planning manager for Portland Parks. Um, we just are a little concerned about the uh, reduction in service on line 15, which goes to the Thurman Gate in Forest Park. Um, it is uh, looks like it's being uh, severely reduced and actually eliminated on weekends. Um, we understand TriMet's under huge financial, um, you know, burden right now and uh, ridership is probably way down because of the pandemic. Um, but we would like you to consider upping the. The service that you're planning uh, and also have it available on weekends right now. It's every 30 minutes. So that's pretty good service. Um, it's very important to have a transit alternative to get to Forest Park. Uh, from an equity standpoint and from folks that don't have vehicles. Um, so we just would like you to consider um, not, first of all, not. Our preference would be just keeping the current service. If that's not doable, can we expand it a little bit more than what you've got planned and um, maybe and maybe have a temporary reduction for a year or so and see how ridership goes. Um, but thank you for your consideration. No, Brett, thank you very much for your consideration. Uh, I know I, I was out there looking at that line just yesterday, understanding kind of the safety issues. I, I know that staff is looking at alternatives to, to kind of address some of the concerns, but we have a number of uh, comments and, and uh, uh, emails from folks who are very concerned about the same thing you are. So thank you for bringing that up to our attention. So thank so you. Jeff, does that, does that conclude our, uh, our speakers this morning? Um, I have a hand that's going up and down. Um, I'd like to check with them if that's okay with okay. you. Please do. So, uh, Kate. Hi. You're um, unmuted. My yes. Uh, yeah, I can testify quickly. Okay, go ahead. Please go ahead. Yes. Um, so, my name is Kate Firetag. I am also uh, testifying in opposition of the changes to the line 15 Thurman branch. Um, I'm a neighbor in the area and pre pandemic used the line to commute with my young daughter. Um, so one of the issues that I would also point out is that the service that is proposed cuts the line from our sort of neighborhood sh shopping area. It reroutes us to 18th and 19th. It also doesn't go downtown, so commuters can't get downtown, can't get to our sort of shopping districts on 23rd and 21st. Um, and having the bus only go twice a day would eliminate the possibility for people like me using it to drop a young child off at daycare. I used to get on the bus, drop her off, get back on the bus, go to work 
and do the back. So having two buses a day doesn't work for hopping on and off. Um, and then as Brett mentioned, it reduces, basically eliminates access to Forest Park um, as well as the White Shield property has now been bought by the Japanese garden or is in the process of being so. So all the people that will be accessing that property will have to do that by car as well. Um, so although it seems like it's just a residential neighborhood and that this is just a commuter bus, it really accesses um, things at the end of this line that are that should be accessible to the whole city. Forest Park being not a neighborhood park at all. It is a citywide park. And then the Japanese Institute is also going to be a citywide resource for people visiting for lectures and workshops, as well as a full staff of people using that property every day. So cutting the service and rerouting it just doesn't make any sense for any users. And it'll just basically eliminate the pos possibility of using that except for maybe some Lincoln High School students, which even then having only four rides a day will, won't will allow those students to use do after school activities or sports. So it really be, will become unusable for everybody with the proposed changes. Thanks. Thank you, Kate. Uh, again, there's a lot of other people who feel the same way you do. And as I said, staff is taking a, a look at that and we will not be taking any final action on this today, but we will be hearing uh, a report from staff. So if you can stick around and listen, that would probably be helpful. But if not, we'll, I'm sure you'll be brought up to speed. Thanks. Thanks again. So Jeff, is that it now? That is it. Okay. Well, I'm going to close the public forum then. And before we uh, do get into our formal meeting, I just want to uh, say a couple things uh, and, and, and express to the union folks that um, it's been my desire, and I believe the desire of the, the full board to really uh, have uh, our staff work with ATU at the bargaining table to make changes to with the apprenticeship and trading programs that will benefit our employees and also meet the needs of uh, TriMet and its mission to provide transit service to the public. There's clearly some disagreements about the quality, the, the cost, and uh, we, we know that we are having trouble meeting our staffing needs. So. I think what I want to do is, is make it clear that we have trust that the TriMet management team will bring the board, hopefully some agreed upon language that we can then support. And uh, it's probably not appropriate with us to meet with the union leadership uh, until uh, we've exhausted all of the opportunities at the bargaining table. So I do implore the union leadership to continue to come to the table. And I'm glad that we are now talking about it to bargain in good faith and to figure out how we can really develop a mutually beneficial agreement on how to improve our training programs for your members and the agency, because we want uh, our employees to have advancement opportunities. We just think that there's better ways to provide a, a number of the uh, training to, for our workers to help them move forward. So I'll ask uh, Sam to give us a little more update uh, in his uh, director's update uh, this morning. Uh, but I just wanted to get on the record that we want to work with the union on this one. Thank you. So with that, I'm going to call the board meeting um, for March 24th, 2021 to order. And uh, and I do note that that uh, Director Way has been able to, do, to join us. I'm still not seeing uh, uh, Director Edwards on the list, but I know we're trying to get him signed in. So we'll hopefully get, get to him before we get down to our resolutions today. Uh, and before we get into the board reports, I wanna take an opportunity to uh, extend a warm welcome to Dr. Laverne Lewis, who joins the TriMet board to serve District 6, which covers East Multnomah County. And uh, the board has gotten to know Dr. Lewis a bit. She's a busy woman serving on a number of boards uh, for organizations that serve communities throughout the region, including the Mount Hood Community College Board, Rosemont Initiative, Northwest United Methodist Foundation. And I also know that she serves on the Greater Northwest Episcopal Area's Innovation and Vitality Team. And on top of this public service, Dr. Lewis is an adjunct professor of accounting at Portland Community College. 
and she brings a wealth of knowledge and experience to the board of directors and spent nearly 18 years in law enforcement before pursuing her, her most recent endeavors. And, and one additional though, Dr. Lewis was appointed and, and, uh, and served three years on Oregon's advisory committee to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. So she's very qualified. Uh, Dr. Lewis, uh, I should have introduced you probably before the public forum, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to say a few uh, words to anybody who might be listening today. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, um, Director Warner, and good morning to um, everyone that is listening, everyone that's here, and all my fellow uh, directors. Um, it's a pleasure to be a part of TriMet, and I'm really looking forward to diving in and um, hitting the ground running, lots to learn, uh, pacing myself, and um, it's just really wonderful to be part of the community that TriMet serves. I'm looking um, forward to serving East County um, as well as I can. That is my area and I'm very active with the community, the neighbors, um, the constituents that live there. So thank you and thanks for and welcoming me this morning. Yeah, well, again, welcome to the to the TriMet board. Your, uh, your contributions are appreciated already. Um, I also want everybody to know that we have another new board member who's going to be joining us this summer, which is Thomas Kim, who's from District 1, which is my district, because uh, on July 1, my term will end and, uh, and uh, Mr. Kim will be uh, be on board then. And uh, it's important to note with these two appointments, TriMet will have the most diverse uh, board of directors in our agency's history. And uh, that's something to be very proud of and we will wear as a Badge of honor is our testament to the broad and diverse communities that we serve. So we'll look forward to Thomas coming on board too. So with that, I'm going to go right to the board reports. And the first board report is the uh, Committee on Accessible Transportation, or as we know it, CAT. And I'll ask Director uh, uh, Irish Bauman to uh, comment on that. Yes, good morning, everyone. The CAT held its um, monthly meeting last week, March 17th. Here's a very quick report. Uh, the cat heard from Pat Williams, who's the director for security and emergency management. Um, he spoke about implementing the reimagining public safety initiative. Um, he also talked about a current issue. He said that uh, data analysis has identified five bus lines uh, that experience the most assaults and disruptions. And he said that security staff are increasing their presence on those bus lines with the goal of reducing assaults on operators and riders, and that's been well received, including by operators who feel more safe now. Uh, John Gardner gave a presentation on the project for reimagining public safety and security. He said that in the next 24 months, there'll be a focus on training, technology, communication, system presence, and infrastructure. Uh, finally, the Lyft staff gave a report on Lyft operations, including uh, they reported that the data shows uh, improved uh, on-time performance in the lift uh, function. So that was good news, and that is the report. Thank you very much, uh, Director Bauman. Are there any questions or comments for uh, Director Bauman? Seeing none, then let's move on to the uh, next committee, which is the Finance and Audit Committee, uh, Director Simmons. Good morning, everyone. Um, this morning, uh, the Finance and Audit Committee met and we reviewed three topics, which I'll talk about individually. One is the proposed budget update. The other is the review of the FY21 uh, budget appropriations resolution, which we will receive in April, and then an update on labor negotiations. First, the proposed budget um, uh, that we're going to act on today and be asked to approve. Uh, Nancy Young Oliver provided us not only an overview of it, but an online interaction with how um, the document has changed. And also that TriMet has received a government finance officer's distinguished budget presentation award, uh, received it in July of 2020 based on the reformat of our budget document and for 
uh, Laverne, you haven't seen our budget document prior to this one, but oh my gosh, it has changed so substantially and the features and functions that are available online versus the written document uh, really raise the question about whether board members want to receive the physical document or in the future or whether the online version. And so we'll each get an option as to how we receive future uh, budget uh, documents. Um, trying to look at, we can't actually realize the features and functions unless it's electronic. So it's up to each individual. So we'll be looking at that and being asked to approve um, the FY22 annual budget later in today's meeting. We also got a preview by Dee and Nancy Young Oliver um, on the appropriate the, the budget appropriation resolutions that we'll be asked to approve in a, in our April meeting and um, remind board members that um, a budget is nothing more than a plan. And when the staff build a budget, they build contingency contingency authorization because if through the year, we receive additional resources or we, we want uh, to spend money in different ways, um, the contingency allows us to um, modify the budget during the year by moving that spending authority into the budget. So that's what we'll be doing in April. And then lastly, uh, Kim Sewell and Laird Kusak gave us an update on where we are in terms of labor negotiations and um, what some of the next steps are moving forward. So as Bruce indicated, um, we, we sincerely, all of us sincerely hope that we can come to an, an equitable resolution on both parties side in terms of this, um, resolving this contract negotiation. Thank you. Questions or comments for Director Simmons? Not seeing any. So uh, let's move on to the Metro Policy Advisory Committee MPAC. I don't know whether they've been meeting uh, Director Way, but is there an update this morning? Yes. Can everyone hear me? Yes. I thank you. I just was having a lot of technical difficulties this morning, and I know Director Edwards was also trying to get in. So. Good morning, everyone, and welcome Dr. Laverne Lewis. Um, very excited that you are joining our board and looking forward to working with you. So um, there are three items on impact at the uh, February 24th meeting that I just wanted to quickly cover. The first is a review of the economic recovery strategy. Um, this is a comprehensive economic development strategy um, that um, gets renewed every five years. Um, Metro is working very closely with Greater Portland, Inc. Um, and this is really um, a targeted strategy um, to help businesses, small businesses um, that have been hardest hit by COVID and in particularly um, uh, immigrant, refugee, black, indigenous, people of color owned businesses. Um, the second impact uh, area is really advancing economic mobility uh, for the region. Um, and that also includes supporting families and children as a part of that. So again, this is a regional effort. Um, the second item that we discussed was regional emergency transportation routes. Um, you may remember that last year we had significant amount of wildfires, um, particularly in my county and in Clackamas. And I know that parts of Washington were also affected by this. Um, but this is about, um, you know, a, about a year and a half um, planning project um, uh, with 30 representatives from 17 agencies to really provide expertise in emergency transportation planning, operation, and public transit. And um, there's a targeted stakeholder outreach and engagement process happening currently. Um, and in winter and spring, um, there will be a review and an acceptance of um, some uh, uh, this particular process um, of looking at various routes and, and uh, corridors uh, for emergency and an implementation um, after that. And then last but not least, um, we also heard about 
um, an opportunity for community based organizations um, that are particularly serving um, again BIPOC uh, black indigenous people of color um, communities. Um, it's a funding opportunity for them to get multi year funding by Metro. Um, it focuses on uh, working towards Metro's goals in the region, as well as civic engagement and leadership development and uh, letter of interest are due on March 31st applications from finalists. Um, uh, May 7th and grantees will be notified May 21st. So they've asked all of us to spread the word to any, um, you know, any community based organizations in our area who might be interested in this um, capacity building grant. And then I just want to say just two things um, because um, uh, uh, it's just one of the issues has just really hit home to me. But um, as many of you may know, um, there was a very recent and tragic um, shooting that happened uh, early last week where, um, you know, eight um, folks were targeted um, and killed in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, six of them were Asian women. And this is, um, you know, a hate crime, um, a targeted hate crime based on race and based on gender. And um, the Asian community has just really been hurting um, from not only that experience, but also just from um, just a massive uptake in um, Asian hate violence and, uh, you know, hate crimes um, that has been happening really since the beginning of the pandemic due to, um, you know, terrible language um, that's coming out. So um, I just really appreciated TriMet for, um, and Sam and others for um, uh, presenting a statement. Um, uh, I think it's really important for particularly the Asian community to know and, 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 and feel like we are hearing them um, as an agency and that we are here to, um, you know, protect them as well as um, support other communities who may be impacted by, um, you know, race and discrimination. So um, thank you. And just sorry, last but not least, since I missed the earlier testimony, I only caught a little bit of, um, you know, what ATU and some of the workers were saying. And, um, you know, I know that we are in a, in a unique position right now with discussions on labor negotiation, but I just want to highlight just the importance of apprenticeship programs and supporting our workers, especially those on the front lines. Um, I, I see this um, for me as one board member as a leadership opportunity, a training opportunity uh, for for our workers um, and especially ones who are, um, you know, looking for TriMet for opportunities to grow in our agency. So um, that's how I feel. and. I know that Director Edwards was trying to get on. I know that his voice was very also important in this issue. And once he joins on, I would definitely love, um, you know, our board to give him an opportunity to speak about this as well. Thank you for the extended time. I realize I'm still muted. So, uh, are there any questions for uh, Director Way about the Metro Policy Advisory Committee? Yeah, I've got a, a question, President sure. Warner. Uh, actually, it's not so much a question; it's more of a, a, a request, a friendly request. Um, there was some grant opportunities that were mentioned, cap capacity building grants. Um, we have several community partners in the Transit Equity Advisory Committee who sound like potential um, applicants and great beneficiaries, uh, candidates for these applications. I um, encourage you to make sure that John Gardner and the team have information about that and have an opportunity to extend it to our TAC partners. I think that would be a fantastic um, a thing to do to extend to our network. Good. We will do that. Thank you. And I see uh, Director Edwards is finally with us. He's got his computer problem solved. So welcome. Thank you very much. It's good to finally be here. I was getting a little bit frustrated. Yeah, I bet you. Well, were. I'm, I'm going to be honest. I was getting a lot frustrated. <laughs> okay. Um, well, let's go to the uh, uh, the last uh, board report that's on our. Uh, 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 under our agenda today, which is the GM search committee update. Uh, Director Bauman, do you um, want to kick this off? President Warner? Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry, I, I 
I have to point out there's a TIAC in there right between MPAC oh. and the GM search update. I just didn't want to overlook them. You know, I tried to get it twice earlier, so let's go back. I'm sorry. So let's go back to the Transit okay. Equity Advisory Committee. Thank you so much for your uh, subtle hint that I that I can't uh, keep the agenda straight. <laughs> Director Gonzalez, please give us a report. I'll make it as brief as I can. I appreciate it. We had a, a great brief yet focused TIAC meeting um, in March. It began with an update from me on the GM recruitment. And uh, it was an opportunity to share an overview on the discussions we've had at the committee level, the efforts that we are discussing on how to bring the community um, into the process. So it was a great opportunity to just share an update, get some feedback. Um, and we uh, gave some updates on the um, the surveys and the results of some of that, which you'll hear about in a sec. So we talked a little bit about that. Um, we talked a little bit about the plan timeline, the phases of the selection process, and and some of the TIAC members were able to ask questions and um, you know get a little deeper on the status of this. Um, we agreed to provide some recruitment updates to TIAC throughout this process um, and every meeting until it's completed. So. That was well received and um, then I took off. I had to go um, lead our Spanish language um, community forum on the GM search process. And um, so that was a really exciting thing. But um, once I left staff took over and uh, had a series of updates, um, they talked about some of the um, measures around COVID, around the cleaning of the system, around the services. And then um, Carl Green provided an update um, He's our, our director on the Title VI um, program, and so he was providing an update on the Title VI review for all of the proposed service changes that we're about to discuss in the ordinances. And then at the end, um, a few TIAC members share some updates from their agencies, from their uh, organizations, and then the meeting was adjourned. Um, so um, it's it went pretty quick, and we have um, an announcement that we shared with everyone at TIAC, which I'd like to share with you. We've got a new member joining TIAC in our next meeting. The April meeting scheduled for the 13th of April um, will have the Urban League as a new representative. So we're excited to be bringing the Urban League on board to the TIAC committee. Good. Thank you. Uh, questions or comments for Director Gonzalez? Hearing none. Now we'll move on to the um, search committee update and director Bauman, do you want to uh, kick this off and maybe you and JC can tag team on this? Right, thank you. So the search committee, as you know, is me, uh, director Gonzalez and director Simmons. We, with input from the um, community and from stakeholders, we've uh, uh, prepared a, a job description for the general manager. Uh, and later in the meeting, we're going to ask the board to um, approve that job description so that the recruitment can begin. Uh, but first, uh, JC is going to uh, present, JC Vanetta is going to present um, a summary of the outreach that has taken uh, place so far. And before that, though, I do want to introduce Greg Moser, our executive recruiter, who is here today, who will be available to answer questions. All right, JC. Yes, thank you, Director Bauman. Uh, Jeff, do you have the the PowerPoint? Will you be bringing it up? Um, I was not sent the PowerPoint, JC. Oh, okay. Let me let me quickly like, bring it up. Sorry. Okay. Let me share. One second, getting my screen to share. There we go. There we, we go. It. So I think I'm just gonna use this mode if you all don't mind, because I'm <laughs> most familiar with it and I have less uh, technical issues. So this is, um, this is just an update from what you saw last Friday during your executive session on our uh, GM hiring outreach. Um, and I'll go through this fairly quickly. You all have um, to date all of the outreach that we have received. Um, and so it's in 
those uh, spreadsheets, the emails, the verbatims from the survey, it's all in your hands. Just a reminder that the feedback that we have received have uh, really three functions. The tweaks to the job description, which is before you now, and uh, it also will help inform all of you on your overall evaluation of the candidates and the ultimate decision that you will make. And it's also going to help inform interview questions that the search committee <laughs> develops. Now, utilizing a public engagement uh, plan approved by the search committee, we launched on February 15th. We started with trimat.org backslash GM. That was our housing area for all of our stuff related to the search, our timeline and information. We also began promoting our survey and listening sessions. Um, we sent out a media release like we normally do, getting coverage on it out over to 4,000 people. And we also sent it internally to all of our employees. And we promoted the survey and listening session to all of them. And, and we'll go over that here in a second. We then launched an email campaign, sending it out to over 100,000 people promoting our survey and our listening sessions to community-based organizations, lawmakers, low-income fair participants, and even uh, our own employees. So trying to get the word out far and wide. Uh, we also utilize both of our newsletters internally. Uh, one is our main newsletter, and then we also used our Equity on the Move newsletter sending the information and survey listing sessions out in multiple langu languages, uh, where the surveys were in multiple languages as well. Um, we also did a lot of work to get this digitally in front of people. A lot of folks, obviously, during the pandemic, <clears throat> excuse me, aren't picking up newspapers like they used to. So we really tried to get it into the places where people were um, getting information, a lot of social media, through our community based organizations. Uh, we did do ads in English, Sp Spanish and Russian. What we find found out and we continue to learn a lot about our outreach efforts. I would say, especially during the pandemic, um, we weren't able to purchase ads in Chinese, Korean and Vietnamese. Um, there aren't uh, large enough communities, so we really worked at getting the surveys in those languages uh, really out to folks through our community based organizations. You all know and thank you for participating in four uh, listening sessions, one in Spanish, as, as Director Gonzalez said, and three in English. We had them streaming via WebEx, YouTube, and Facebook Live. Um, you can see the tallies on your screen. We, we received 75 written comments and eight yes. verbal. So a pretty good showing, although a lot. Uh, I think other people have a lot of things going on. Here are a couple of quotes I just wanted to share with you and the community of what we heard. Now, these are just a sampling, but the new GM must know that some of the immigrant community escaped from their country where they experienced violent acts by police. Please offer training for TriMet police. The person, GM, must understand that the customer is the most important and that transit service must be accessible as possible to the largest number of community members. Two more quotes I want to share. He or she must understand that the employees are not just a number but the main part that make everything else. The general manager should have good leadership, be open to ideas and accept feedback, and should know about buses, routes, and the city and TriMet itself. So those are just uh, some quotes to give you an idea of what we heard on um, the themes. Obviously, you all know this, cultural competency. They want better safety and security, and you'll see more of that. Better communication to riders, um, improvements in the system infrastructure, um, union contract, working with our union to uh, on their new contract, must have previous experience, really looking at service frequency, and you're going to hear more about that, and then, of course, leadership. One of our biggest things that we put in front of folks was the survey. I call it the universal feedback tool, but it, that way it helps hone in and getting um, feedback in a, in a logical thought process. Uh, to date, well, not to date, but as of March 19th, we had over 3,200 uh, surveys filled out, a bulk of them from our Riders Club, our, our website, our massive database at TriMet. And we even had some of our customer service folks with QR codes. We're in, within the pandemic, we're all familiar with QR codes now. And they really had QR codes out at transit facilities where people could scan it with their phones and then take the survey. 47 came in through our community-based organizations. 58 were done in Spanish, Russian, and Chinese. No uh, no surveys came back in Vietnamese or Korean, and 420 of our own employees took the survey and responded. 
Um, I'll just touch on this. We had a great uh, smattering of age, gender, and the ethnicity kind of matched what our region looks like. Um, you'll see over the counties how it broke out. But I think uh, what was really important is ridership. Do they ride now? Do they ride? Did they ride before COVID? And an interesting factoid that 9% uh, responded to the survey and had never ridden uh, TriMet. Now let's go into the survey. How important are the following attributes of a GM candidate? The first and foremost is the ability to install a culture of safety for both employees and customers. And you're going to continue to hear that. Uh, number two and three, experience in delivering, delivering high levels of customer service and satisfaction and understanding and responding to issues relating to equity and racial and environmental justice. So those are the kind of the top three. Um, you'll see history of leading inclusive public decision making processes next, addressing climate change, crisis management and helping to lead the agency out of the COVID downturn. Oh, oh goodness, sorry. Um, and then rounding out that demonstrated ability to grow leader, ridership and a background in leading and delivering major construction projects. Question two, what would be most important to you? Most people said experience in the transit field in a similar sized agency. 30% uh, had a long history with the, and familiarity with the Portland region. In the other category, um, from the public, we heard leadership, the top response. From our own employees, it was really working with the union and how um, the new general manager should value employees. Question three, which challenge ahead should the new general manager be, best be prepared for? Let's just look at the numbers and they should be prepared for it all. The number one, expanding service. Uh, number two, addressing safety and security. Number three, the backlog, uh, managing the backlog of capital repairs. Four, managing the agency through COVID building ridership, and then achieving climate, TriMet's climate action goals. You'll see in other, we, all, we asked for open-ended. The top were no, from the public were no fares or less fares, and from employees was working with the union and valuing employees. And then finally, the fourth one, and this was an open-ended question that we asked folks, what's the one thing the new general manager should know about TriMet? And so, you know, people say these in their own words, and you have all of these verbatims, and I know Director Simmons has gone through them all. Uh, thank you for that. But um, we kind of tabulated them. Most, uh, you'll see, are wanting more security and safety and enforcing the rules on board. The second one, service expansion, and the third, working with the union and valuing employees. So some good information in your hands now about what we had heard. Um, we will continue doing the outreach. The outreach will not stop. We'll continue getting the survey results. All of the um, information coming in through the feedback, our feedback channels, we will be handing to you every Friday um, so that you continue to hear what people are saying. We have meetings planned with our, our community-based organizations, so we'll still be taking in feedback and passing that along to you. We are also going to be promoting your board meetings, the public forum, and your boarding, board meetings in case people don't feel like they've been heard, whether it's been through um, the listening session or the survey or, or a comment, they have the ability to come and testify at your board meeting. So we'll be con continuing to promote those. And then finally, our recruiter, Greg Mosier, who you'll hear from, um, he's been doing some direct phone calls to key stakeholders to get their feedback. Again, all of this to help inform you uh, for your ultimate decision of the next general manager and then also some of the interview questions. That's all I have for this morning. I will take any questions uh, that you might have. <laughs> You're muted, President Warren. And any questions for JC uh, Venata or uh, Director Bauman on, on this issue? And I don't know whether you want to have great comment now or comment during the I agenda item later on. Um, I, I, I'd appreciate hearing from Greg now so that we could uh, let okay. him go. Um, uh, Greg, just uh, about your the outreach you've done, but also how you're going to use the job description of, as part of our next steps in recruiting. Yeah, director, thank you, Director Bauman, and, and thank you to the search committee. JC, thank you for all the outreach efforts you did because it was incredibly helpful for me to get that perspective as well. Um, I did some outreach to help sort of support and complement this and talk to a number of key stakeholders in the community um, through direct 
conversations, phone conversations. And I think a lot of the themes that JC pointed out were highlighted in my conversations. Um, and maybe I'll just share a few of those with you if you wouldn't mind. And then I'll talk about how we use those to incorporate into the job description. Um, in my conversations, things like safety and security were paramount because if we don't have a safe and secure system, people won't feel comfortable getting on it and won't use the system in the first place. Um, so that was that was certainly a paramount um, part of of our conversations. Ensuring good operations and on time service that is that is affordable was was something that came up. Uh, we had a number of conversations that I that I uh, of key stakeholders that I spoke to that talked about. Um, Ensuring that there was good, adequate service, particularly to um, dependent riders, people who don't have access to other means of transportation. And I think one of the concerns in the community today is that there are a number of, of areas that don't have good supported networks of services and that they want the next CEO and TriMet as an organization to be able to look and work with um, to identify areas where there can be additional services. I think the other thing I heard that ties into that is being an integral player in the community about different needs and transit is one aspect of providing better services and better access to the community as a whole. And so that they'd like to see the CEO be someone who is present and, and a thought leader and, and actively engaged in the conversation around providing better transit services and making the community better as a whole and how transit can be a vehicle in terms of, of making um, the community better as a whole. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and ensuring that there is fair and adequate services for not only the customer, the rider, but also making sure that TriMet as an organization is representing the community as a whole and is, is reflected in, in the types of people that are working at TriMet also reflect the community. Um, that translated into a conversation in a lot of cases about um, customer service interface that a lot, not that any employee is more important than another employee, but the, but the person or the people that the riders see on a daily basis are those people who are out and about in, in the community that are the, the drivers, the operators, the people who are maintaining the system. And so they wanna make sure that from the CEO's perspective, there's good engagement and there's good support and good understanding because um, ensuring that they're out there providing good customer service, that they're smiling and being responsive to the passengers that get on and off of the system. Um, they also wanted to make sure that the CEO was going and meeting with those employees and listening to what their needs are because they are the front line voice and the, the eyes and the ears of the system as well. And so if a passenger has a concern or someone in the public has a concern, oftentimes those concerns are being shared directly with the, the operator, with the drivers. And so being engaged, going out to uh, the maintenance shops, going out to the bus yards or, or the rail stations and listening to those folks and hearing what's going on and, um, and getting that feedback and taking to that to heart and communicating that to the management team so that changes can be made would be incredibly important. Um, we talked about, uh, we spent some time also talking about uh, climate change, uh, concerns around making sure that Portland is responding to things that are happening and that trend that led us to um, various types of emergency preparedness, whether there is an environmental um, situation that goes on, like a, a bad storm that comes in and, and, and TriMet needs to be helped prepare and, and respond to it, or there's other, some other sort of emergency situation in, in, in the region that TriMet is, is a um, active participant in those sorts of um, situations and making sure that there's responses provided that we make sure that TriMet's well prepared in, in, in dealing with those sorts of things. I think that overall, I got a lot of feedback on making sure that the executive is someone who's a good steward, someone who is listening and responsive, someone who treats people fairly, the employees and the customers, and, and just treats the entire community and, and all of the stakeholders fairly, someone who listens, um, someone who's responsive, and someone who finds solutions to a lot of different problems. You've got a lot of different stakeholders. There are a lot of communities that, are, that, are, um, that TriMet provides services to. And so a lot of the feedback I heard and a lot of the, the comments um, I heard were really about um, making sure that TriMet as a whole and, and through the CEO try to find solutions that can solve a lot of different problems, that it's not a one size fits all and that there's not, um, you know, what may be important for one segment of the community may not be as important for another one and, and vice versa. So you've got to work together to try to find something that, that can work better for everyone. And so those were a lot of the comments I heard, um, just as a quick summary. 
I think that what we did was we went back to the job description and we had a draft job description, which I think was started off in very comprehensive. And we made sure that we really reflected on all of these comments, both from the surveys and the input that JC got, and then also the direct feedback I got um, to make sure that we were inclusive of all of this information. And I think that based on my experience, I think that the job description well reflects that. It, it doesn't get into every nuanced detail, but I don't think that's the intent and the purpose of a job description. The job description is, is really set out to incorporate these broad major themes. I think also the job description represents a wish list of all of the areas we want to try to target. And I often say that um, no one particular person is going to possess all of these items, but this really sets a stage for what we are striving to become and where we're striving to go. And, and so that's what we seek and, and go out and, and set our eyes on. And, and really, as we go and reflect on the candidates and we start to go through interviews and assess these candidates, we use this as sort of the fundamental framework to, to us evaluate those candidates upon. Um, so I think that that's, that's important also. I plan to share this job description. We're going to advertise this so that anyone who feels that they're qualified and would like to apply for the position has the ability to do so. And I will review all of those resumes and all of that information that comes in to qualify uh, those candidates who meet the qualifications. Um, and I'll also send those two candidates who reach out to me asking for the job description and walk them through with us and explain areas that they may have questions about if, if something is not as clear to them as to what we specifically mean by a certain area. So, um, but I will also use this as, as the criteria that I look at and evaluate candidates as I start to siphon this down and provide you with what I believe to be the strongest candidates that, that are available. And so, I'm really excited to to go out there. I think that um, you know, my goal is to go out and and identify the most diverse slate candidates we possibly can, and ensure that that diversity is represented and again reflect the needs of the community, both in terms of the technical capabilities and also the interpersonal skills, and then um, the makeup of the individual people that I'm recruiting as well. So I'm really excited. I'm looking forward to it. I think you have a, a well written, comprehensive job description and. Uh, and and I'm looking forward to bringing you some great candidates. Thank you, uh, Director Bellman. Before I get the the comments, I see a couple of board members have their hands raised. Did you have anything else you wanted to add? Nothing else from me. Thank you. All right. I think Director Way, you were first. Yes, I think um, just a couple of comments um, on the community outreach. I think we. Um, you know, can do better with outreach to the Asian community. Um, I know that, um, you know, there's there's still some barriers to maybe, um, you know, maybe connecting with the right folks or community leaders. Um, but, you know, API, Asian and Pacific Islanders are one of the fastest growing communities of color here in Oregon and particularly in our in our region. And so I just think that we need to improve um, on better community engagement for for that community. Um, and I, I know that, um, you know, there are at least, I'm just making a list, um, at least eight um, ethnic media um, in Korean, Vietnamese, and Chinese um, that reaches, you know, thousands um, of folks who identify in those languages. So I just don't see any reason as to why, you know, we wouldn't be reaching out to the ethnic media um, to get the word out about this. And so um, I just wanted to, again, offer that, you know, our communities are growing. Um, they've been here for many decades and generations and have contributed to our state. Um, and I also um, know that we also have a significant ridership um, that identifies as Asian and Pacific Islander. So again, you know, our outreach and education, especially towards this leadership process, um, you know, needs to reflect um, those community members and their their voices as well. So um, those are just the comments that I wanted to share. Thank you. No, no, Director Boy, you are absolutely correct. And I would say to you that we are constantly improving and we are learning more. Um, and I just a quick little clarification statement um, when I said that we look to purchase some of the our translated ads in some of those other languages. Some of those platforms don't support that, and so. Um, we are learning ourselves and trying to figure out ways to get it into more hands. We would love to work with you and uh, to figure out how to do that. Um, because again, we're always constantly refining our outreach efforts and constantly trying to do more. So um, definitely heard. Thank you. 
Absolutely, yes, and um, I'm definitely a resource, so let's let's touch base. Thanks, JC. Perfect. Thank you. Director Edwards, did you have your hand up? Yeah, thank you very much, Director Warner. Um, I just wanted to applaud the committee for the work that they're doing and also uh, Greg and JC um, for the work that you're doing as well. Um, it's very good work and I know it's a difficult task. Um, I wanted to um, also uh, uh, piggyback on uh, Director Wade's comments though in regards to outreach. Um, I don't know if there's been outreach to neighborhood associations um, but um, certainly um, that's an avenue that um, is very vibrant in the city of Portland. And I think it's important to reach out to them and get some feedback from them as well, because they can also be a, a conduit to the um, many folks that do uh, utilize the services of TriMet that maybe don't feel that they have a voice. Um, <clears throat> but also when we talk, when, as Director Way was saying, when we talk about our uh, different um, demographics, it's important to realize that, you know, um, media uh, like the Asian Reporter uh, need to be used, the Hispanic News, um, the uh, Scanner, and the uh, Portland Observer. Um, and the message can't always be the same because um, there are cultural differences and, um, it's, and you have to approach different cultures in different ways. And so that's why it's important to make sure that we we do that appropriately because if you don't approach them in, a, in the appropriate way, you, um, you won't get a, a response. And you'll wonder then, you know, figure that they're not interested or disinterested, and that's not true. So it's important that we um, look at those things and make sure that we're, you know, using the, the correct messaging to uh, reach out to folks and um, so that we can get a response from each and every one because we want everyone to have input into this. That, um, that that has an issue or concern that, that should be heard and raised. Thank you, Director Edwards. Well, that's all that's shown on the agenda. I wanted to give the uh, uh, board a quick update because I did it in informally last week, but the public needs to know that as part of our reimagining uh, public safety on transit effort, as you heard today, which is what was developed with the community and stakeholder groups to help us implement new community-based services and other opportunities to really make our transit system better. And by that, I mean more safe, welcoming, and equitable for all. And this plan included things like the crisis intervention team, a greater presence of uh, TriMet employees, which included fare inspectors, what I think we've called ambassadors in the past, unarmed security, and a lot of training. And then, of course, transit police. and. Uh, we have been working with the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office for months to take over the leadership of the transit police elements of this revised safety program. And last week, uh, our, uh, our agreement with the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office was before the Multnomah County Board of Commissioners for their approval. And as I told you, if anybody listening needs to know that John Gardner, Sam DeSue, our interim general manager, and I met with all of the commissioners and we answered a lot of questions about what was in our overall proposed seven-year budget for public safety, and also what it, it can include, even though it may not have been explicitly called out. So we gave them assurances that these funds can be used to cover the cost of portions of what we will ensure, that will ensure that we, I'm talking about the county, TriMet, and the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office have the expertise and ability to develop a crisis response team with behavioral health expertise, mental health expertise, and links to their homeless programs as part of this agreement, this, which is exactly the kind of thinking that we wanted to have in our reimagining public safety. And also from our conversation with the commissioners, we agreed with them that there needs to be regular and ongoing updates with their board uh, by TriMet and the sheriff on our progress and success if this IGA was to be approved. And uh, I was pleased to, to announce that with uh, those clarifications, and consensus on bringing together other county resources to address transit safety and security. The Board of County Commissioners unanimously approved the agreement between the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office and TriMet. And I expect our uh, our staff will be giving us uh, 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 lots of updates on this as it's fully implemented. But I feel really good about Sheriff Reese and, and kind of his pro uh, proactive uh, community-based approach to policing. And I think we can be a frankly, a model for the nation on this one. And I want to thank 
John and Sam, but also Tom Mark Graff uh, for a lot of work in making this successful. So I wanted to get that on the record for you. And I'd, and I'd be glad to answer any questions from any board members on that, on that one too. And finally, uh, please. Yes, thank you, Director Warner. I, I do have a question. Um, did the uh, discussion um, come up around oversight and um, and what the, what that would look like and who would be involved in the um, oversight? You know, it did. And I think the, uh, the intent was that there would be a community group that would be put together to help the sheriff's office and uh, the county really oversee, but also measure the progress to make sure we're, we're accomplishing what we want to do with this program. So you will see a, a community oversight group put together. Uh, I don't think that's been set up if, if Sam or, or John Gardner is on, maybe they can give you some more information on that. But it, but it was clear that there's going to be a lot of engagement with the community and oversight all the way around on this. Yeah, totally agree, Mr. President. This is Sam DeSue. We will have a panel that's put together. It's in the process now, and there will be community participation on the panel with oversight of the program. Through the chair, may I ask, um, do, do we know what the makeup of that panel is gonna be? How many community members? Um, um, are they gonna come from um, one district of the, um, you know, out of the seven? Um, Will they will it be made up of TriMed employees, TriMed staff? Um, what is that going to look like? Are there going to be um, um, uh, police officers on there? Um, what is that going to look like? Yeah, I think Sam said it's still yet to be determined. But Stan, do you have any more information on that? We're still working on the makeup now, and uh, we will be letting everyone know here very shortly. Just want to. Now, I don't want this to go on too long, but I would like to ask too: uh, Will the board have input as to um, what that um, um, that oversight committee will look like? Well, let's let's set the the expectation that we will. Okay, Sam. I think he's nodding his head there. Director Way, did you have a comment too? Sure. Um, yes, yeah, Sam and team. Thank you so much for and and Bruce for bringing this. You know, really important topic again to the board meeting and director Edwards. I also echo, um, you know, having the importance of, um, I think a representative and a diverse, um, you know, age, gender, um, ethnicity, life experience, occupation, um, on this oversight committee, because, um, as it was just mentioned earlier, if, if we're creating a national model, then it needs to, you know, we need to act that like, this is the gold standard that we want, you know, potentially the, the rest of the nation to follow. So, um, you know, no pressure on, on our on our end, but I think that we have, um, you know, amazing people in our agency and um, in Multnomah County and very highly engaged community stakeholders, I think, who would love, you know, to give input. Um, my only question is um, the various positions um, that will be created. So, um, I just would like to, you know, maybe a six month report later down the road. Um, just would love to see what are the actual positions um, that are being created, um, at least in the one year or in the two year of, um, of the seven year contract, because I, because these are public dollars, right? So the public needs to know where the investment is going to um, particularly around um, staffing. So um, that would be my only request. It's a good good comment. And I think that's exactly the uh, comments that the Multnomah County board members wanted to. So we'll be, uh, that's why the regular update dates will be there. And I will point out, we do have a new member on our board who has a lot of experience uh, with the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office. So I, I think in terms of board liaison, I, you know, I'm, I think we need to, to figure out who that would be, but I, I know who I would probably pick if I was in, a, in this, if I'm going to continue to be here for a few months. So we'll have some further discussions about that. Other comments? Uh, I, I did want to, Keith, um, uh, uh, Director Way mentioned that, you know, you, we probably had five or six folks talk to us this morning about the importance of the, uh, of the apprenticeship and training programs at TriMed and, and frankly, you know, some of them beat us up in terms of what are, are we're, we're not being where they want. But uh, 
Director Way thought you might have some comments for us this morning. Very much. Yes, I do. Um, I'm just concerned about the tenor of uh, TriMet's um, approach to this and um, the message that's that's been gone out because um, they didn't come out of thin air. And I'm just I'm very concerned about that. And um, I've been concerned about it for some time and I've expressed that um, um, so that we can keep it at the forefront. It's um, it's really speak to the core of um, of our mission and our values. And it, um, it, it, it really flies in the face of that, in my opinion, in regard to our approach. Um, and I know, um, you know, we don't get involved in the negotiation, but certainly the attitude and the behavior that, that, um, that has been the, the image and message that TriMet has sent has not been um, good for, um, for our PR, for one thing, and it's certainly not good because we're, it sounds like we're talking out of both sides of our mouth, in, in my opinion. Um, and I think that 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 has to change. Um, we have to um, change that approach and change that behavior. Um, I heard some of the testimony this morning um, through the YouTube, and um, and it it really um, it, it really it resonated because um, I don't think it 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 came from a place of um, of attack. I don't think it it came from an adversarial place. I think it came from a, a factual place, and I'm I'm going to be um, actually trying to find out. I'm going to um, uh, get the testimony that was uh, given at the uh, uh, hearing yesterday at, at, in the uh, legislature, and uh, because I want to see what that you know what was actually said um, by uh, TriMet as well as any other uh, testimony that was um, presented to the legislators, and I think that's important to know. And I would encourage the rest of the board to do the same. Um, because um, we, we're, our position is that, you know, we've come up with the, um, with the um, mission, we've come up with the vision uh, for TriMet, and um, like I say, I, I get concerned because, you know, we can't say one thing and do something totally different. And um, just, that's, that just, it, it doesn't bode well for us as an agency. It, it, we don't look good uh, with the community. We don't have any um, integrity when it comes to the community. And this has been a major issue, um, a, a major um, a point of contention with the negotiations. And um, it doesn't build um, a relationship. It hasn't been in, in any relationship building. And that, that has to change. Um, the, the community suffers and the public suffers. And that's, it's certainly not fair to them. And I think the onus is on TriMet to uh, work to make sure that we build those bridges and make sure that we're um, not the ones that are setting fire to the bridges. And so there, there's going to have to be some changes um, and, um, and, and made soon. And I think that, that, um, that has to be, like I say, at the forefront of the key to what we're doing, because if we have people that are um, actually um, uh, promoting um, or the, on the negotiation team that aren't exhibiting and behaving with the vision and the, and the mission that TriMet has, then um, we need to find um, uh, folks that will. And I'll just be real clear about that. So that's what I have to say. Thank you. Okay, that was quite a bit to say. I think maybe Sam, you can give us update on the uh, negotiations, but I also know there's differences of opinion about uh, what's been said and where we are on this stuff, uh, Director Edwards. So hopefully we May can I, have an honest discussion about that too. May I say a little something on the heels of that? Uh, sure. I, I don't mean to jump in front of you, uh, Director Dessou. I just want to make sure that I add and echo the sentiments of, of Director Edwards. Um, and and really emphasize what I think is missing most in this process right now. Um, and I'll call it a simple alignment of facts. There seems to be a tale of two stories with very basic things. Um, and uh, I know that uh, we're coming out of what, what you could call a fake news world and a world where facts don't seem to to um, be mean what they used to. Um, but this is not a space for alternative facts. I think we have the opportunity to just align on um, the basics of if there are diversity questions, um, what are the diversity statistics and 
really who holds the the torch when it comes to ensuring that there is a diverse pool of candidates made available. Um, that seems to be something that we're not basically in agreement with currently. The cost of the programs, um, there seems to be dispute about what the what the cost is, and those basic facts, I think, um, if we're not in alignment, they 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 foster a a place where we can have really different um, realities, different perspectives on what the issues are and what the solutions are. Um, so I'd love to hear a little bit of that. And and the, the other one that was a concern to me uh, is there doesn't seem to be an alignment on the fact of what sort of ideas have already been proposed proactively to address the concerns uh, that have been well known, well documented, well established around the apprenticeship programs. Um, and, um, I, we're in a space where it seems like it, we're choosing it's either this or that, um, but I haven't really heard what ideas have been thrown out perhaps in the process. And there seems to be a misalignment on whether ideas were provided, whether they were properly evaluated or not. So, um, you know, I think that all makes all of this stuff come out in, in spaces well past the bargaining table where it should be. But I want to echo um, the sentiments of Director Edwards that this is critical. It's not it's not boating very well um, for either a ATU or TriMet right now. And the way I see it, there is no future that does not include both of those entities at the table, ensuring that we're serving the public um, proactively. So I just don't know what that looks like, but I'd really appreciate that we try to begin with an alignment of basic facts here. Good comment. Oh, Director Edwards uh, and also Director Gonzalez. Uh, just wanted to just take a moment to let you know that we are actively negotiating um, over a new contract. We've met five times in March. We've reached a number of agreements on contract provisions during this last few weeks, and we continue to exchange proposals on the issues that we don't have agreement. The main sticking point, as we've talked about here, is how we're looking at making adjustments to the apprenticeship program. Much like what we heard today, you know, we've heard some sentiments from our community members, lawmakers, congressional staff, that the apprenticeships are important and we couldn't agree more. We just wanna make our work better. Um, and all of those that who's commented this morning, we know that we're actively negotiating with the ATU. It's, it's very encouraging to me just as well to see that We've made some progress in negotiations, and we believe that we just need to continue to find mutual understanding uh, between the situation that we're dealing with, and that's the apprenticeship uh, conversation. We know that a negotiated outcome is the best outcome, and it's our hope that we can work together and come to an agreement. So we have ongoing talks scheduled, and we're hopeful that we can come to consensus as we move forward. Thank you. All right, I think we need to, to move, move on and we're not gonna get through our agenda at all this morning. So I'd like to go to the general manager's report. Mr. General Manager, and maybe you could be brief today since I think uh, uh, we do have a large agenda. Uh, thanks, President Warner. Uh, also members of the board, everyone, thank you for being here today. This morning we will share timely information on COVID-19 and our next steps, our February ridership, we're going to also show you how we're enhancing the customer experience, the quarterly performance report, and then finally an update on our business plan. I'll start by beginning with the COVID update. We are closely monitoring the Portland area and county protocols as we begin to emerge from a year of lockdowns. All three counties we serve are now in the medium risk category for COVID, and our statewide counts have dropped dramatically. At TriMet, we continue to follow all of our COVID-19 safety protocols that's requiring masks, offering masks and hand sanitizer on board, really cleaning and sanitizing our vehicles nightly and throughout the day. It's great news to see the timeline has moved up for our frontline and mission critical workers to get vaccinated. Governor Brown just announced that frontline workers will be eligible for the vaccine no later than April 19th. And Washington Governor Inslee has already authorized vaccines for frontline workers. So because of that, we are encouraging our employees that live in Washington state to get vaccinated. It's another step to really protect themselves, their families and our customers. 
We're in close communications with Oregon Health Authority as well, as we are ready to move forward with vaccinations for our frontline employees as soon as we get the green light. I know that it's been a long haul for everyone, but it's looking more and more like the end of the pandemic is within sight. Still though, um, it's important for us to remember that we must follow the guidance of our health experts. I'd like to just pause here for a moment and really talk from the bottom of my heart personally to really thank all of our employees, especially those on the front line and mission critical staff that have helped our customers to get where they need to go safely. And as a member of the executive team, I can speak for all of us when I say that you've inspired us, you employees, all of you, you have inspired us with your strength, your resiliency, and your commitment every day to keep our people moving safely and also keep the region moving. So I just wanna thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. Moving on to the February ridership, here at TriMet, we've provided more than 2.7 million rides. While that's substantial, it's notable down 63% from February last year. I believe the keys to the decline in ridership last month was the snow and ice storm that we faced and the impact, the continued impact from the pandemic. Our weekly bus ridership was also down 63%. On max, our weekly ridership was down just over 65%. And on West, we declined 79.5% over this time last year. Just want to put a, a note here. Remember that West is running every 45 minutes instead of every 30 minutes due to the service cuts. We do expect that our customers will begin to come back on board as vaccines become available to more people. And we really look forward to that day. However, though, we are on it and we are doing things already now to start recovering riders. And one of those efforts is an improvement to our website. With that, I would like to ask Executive Director of Public Affairs, JC Vanetta, and Manager of Marketing and Rider Communication, Dave Whipple, to show us how we're improving the customer experience through this big change on our website. JC. That's awesome. Thank you, Sam. President Warner, a member of, members of the board, as we look to bringing riders back to the system, we want to make sure the customer experience is absolutely the best we can deliver. One of those pieces and our largest tool is our website. Um, we've taken on a complete overhaul of our website and I'm excited to share a quick update. Uh, Dave Whipple is here, uh, but first a quick shout out and thank you to our IT division who has been helping. They have been absolutely integral for our success. And with that, Dave, take it away and uh, show them all the fun things that we have. You bet, thanks JC. Uh, hi, President Warner, directors, and welcome Dr. Lewis. I'm Dave Whipple, a manager of marketing and writer communications and public affairs, and we are excited to share uh, progress so far on a major upgrade to TriMet.org. And TriMet.org is, uh, as JC mentioned, the agency's primary website. Um, this is, has been a, a good partnership with our enterprise development team in IT. And uh, as we'll get to in a second, this you'll see this incorporates technology that was developed as part of the Open Trip Planner and Mod grant work that you may have heard about in the past from uh, GIS and Mobility Manager Bibiana McHugh. Um, so my team is responsible for managing many of our external communication channels, which are primarily digital. Uh, this includes our websites, our social media, mobile tools for riders, and TriMet.org is truly our primary channel for communicating with customers, for getting feedback from them, uh, giving them the tools and information they need to become a regular rider and successfully complete uh, and repeat their trips on transit. Uh, so we are currently beta testing a new version of the site. And uh, Jeff, if you will, the first uh, next slide, please. Just for a little background to set the stage uh, as to where we've been and the role uh, that the site plays, to give some context, uh, the site was first created in 1996, and since then it's grown and evolved over time to be a highly used and trusted self-service information hub, essentially, for getting transit info in the Portland area. Um, we Pre-COVID, the traffic that we would receive at, uh, at TriMet.org was around 8 million page views a month, 
Um, and that drop, that number has dropped significantly over the last year as has our ridership. But we still have a sizable audience and demand, uh, and we believe that traffic will ultimately recover as well. We know that for many, many people, TriMet.org is the first point of contact with our brand and with our system. So it's very important in terms of serving our customers and a very powerful marketing tool for the agency. Jeff, next slide, please. As far as what uh, our customers come for uh, when they visit TriMet.org, we know that 95%, give or take, are a vast majority of our traffic are people coming for what we call our trip tools, the suite of tools that help people get around, get from point A to point B. People wanna know when their bus or train is coming. They wanna plan a trip from one place to another, check for active service alerts, uh, look for schedules and maps on the lines they plan to use. And by putting those trip tools right on the home page, which has been our design strategy for a few years now, we've capitalized on that audience and that attention. And we're really trying to make it as easy as possible for website visitors to take that next step, which is taking the trip. Jeff, next slide, please. Uh, we also know as far as how people use the site, and this all, all of this uh, insight helps us make really good design decisions when we uh, have a project like this. We know that 70% uh, of, of people visiting TriMet.org are accessing it on a phone. And this informs the design strategy that we've been um, in gradually building in over the last few years, and that is making it app-like, making it work really well on a phone, um, this is referred to as a mobile first design, and it, it doesn't mean you, you have to have a smartphone to use it. It just means for those who are using smartphones, it's going to adapt. It's going to respond uh, to the size of your screen and make it really easy and appealing to use on a phone. And that's, that's our goal with this project as well. Uh, next slide, please, Jeff. Thank you. So uh, the business need here, uh, our last update for TriMet.org was about six years ago. And as you might guess, in internet years, that's an eternity. Uh, much can happen in that time. The customer expectations change, competitors emerge. We have new technologies taking root all the time. Uh, new devices gain popularity. And with the Open Trip Planner project I mentioned, and the results of that mod grant work, we now have a map-based trip planner that is ready to be integrated with the rest of our trip tools through this and through this project it's going to be uh, made available to a much broader audience and that's very exciting so from a business perspective we know we need to compete better in this marketplace in order to succeed down the road we know we not only need to encourage more multimodal trips and support ridership recovery efforts in the short term we also need a, a solid technical foundation to build upon, a uh, platform to build upon for future initiatives um, to further improve the customer experience and attract uh, riders. Jeff, next slide, please. And as far as what riders want from us, uh, these items on the list are uh, some of the things that uh, most commonly come up in our research and in our surveys. Uh, the top five items in this list are the ones that this particular project in the short term is focusing on. Um, and this gets back to being a map-based experience, saving some favorites, and uh, seeing vehicle locations on a map, which customers have expressed as are very important um, features to them. And Jeff, next slide. Oh, my apologies. That's just highlighting the top five. <laughs> Jeff, next slide again. Thank you. So to sum up, what uh, the demo I'm going to share here is intended to primarily upgrade our trip tools, um, the, the customer facing trip tools, incorporate our new interactive map from the mod pro grant project, modernize the site in many ways to make it more appealing for more people, and we'll be encouraging more multimodal trips, helping more people get out of their cars. Jeff, next slide. And to re-emphasize again, this is going to set us up for being able to do more fun and innovative things in terms of websites and apps down the road to better serve customers and the business. Jeff, next slide. Uh, this is just, uh, I, sh I think I will skip this one and get to the demo, but we, we, we look into what makes, uh, what are the most important tasks that customers are coming to the site for? 
uh, so that that can inform our design and, and our focus so we know where to focus our energy. Uh, and those top tasks are reflected uh, in the demo you're about to see. So Jeff, if you could pull up beta.trimet.org, great. Now, uh, quickly, I'm just going to ask Jeff to to uh, breeze through a couple tasks here to show off a few of the key features. And I, I should mention again, this is our beta test site at, and it's a public web page at beta.trimet.org. It's open to the public now, and we are accepting feedback from customers and employees and board members. <laughs> I would invite the board to please try it out and weigh in if you like. Uh, there's more information and a feedback link at trimet.org slash beta, which is a little different URL than this one, which is beta.trimet.org. But that page, trimet.org slash beta, has a little more background, uh, a couple different options for providing feedback. And of course, I'm always your feedback is always welcome um, at, uh, to send to me directly as well. So Jeff, Dave, uh, well, yeah. Dave, I was just gonna ask, I wanted to stress to the board, one of the things that I, I want to have passionately say to all of you, in the past, we have been almost a, a wholesaler when it came to um, transportation. And now we're really looking at how we um, appeal to individual riders and customers. People have a lot of choices and we are really working to give them an experience that they might have gotten with Lyft or with Uber, even Lime and, and Bird, and really try. So our, this is our homepage. It is unlike we have in any we've ever done before or any other transit system because we are trying to be uh, there for our customer first. And so it is definitely a change in how we're presenting our online uh, information to the public but it's also what they expect. So it's it's pretty exciting. Go ahead, Dave. Sorry, I just wanted to stress that. You bet. Well, first, as you'll notice, uh, this is the desktop version, which means on a desktop PC with a large screen, you are first presented with a map, uh, full screen map. And on a phone, the, the you will also see the map and you'll also see the info window there with the arrivals, but it'll be, um, uh, situated a little bit different and feel a little bit different because you're on a phone or a tablet. But the idea that uh, we have a prominent full-size map here right off the bat, it, it, we are visually orienting the riders, uh, our prospective riders, to see uh, where they're at and where uh, our service is in relation to them. We have the addition of, of um, all these, these little specks on the map are our real-time uh, vehicle locations for buses and trains, which does a great job not only providing that orientation for the rider, but uh, for us, it's showing the breadth and availability of our service at a glance on the map. You you can turn those off if it gets a little overwhelming, but riders have told us so far they love seeing um, the actual vehicles moving on the map. Uh, when you first pull up trimet.org 2 on a phone, you will see an option to use your current location. So this is an important feature that uh, provides that context uh, that, so the app can deliver location-based, location-specific information that is more relevant to the rider at that time. And that's one of the design targets that we have is to make it smarter, make it work uh, more efficiently and more conveniently. So the rider has to go to less effort to actually get the information that they're looking for. So on a phone, that prompt will come up and say, can we use your current location? And if the user says yes, they will get more customized uh, location specific information. And uh, the content window on the left is showing a, uh, a list of the service and stops nearby. So at, thanks, Jeff. This is yeah perfect if you can just poke around a little bit. As the location changes, the selected location changes, um, you can even, Jeff, you maybe right click on the map and select a new location um, to see service nearby or set as either one. This info window changes to show uh, the real-time arrival information from Transit Tracker at the stops nearest that location. So you're always getting the uh, real-time information for the uh, stops near you. And then that info window also contains uh, some familiar, the other familiar trip tools that riders will expect. Um, the trip planner is uh, the, the uh, features of the new uh, mod grant trip planner, uh, which includes some multimodal features and will um, eventually contain some some additional features to help get people 
thinking about more than just transit and trying to nudge people towards taking um, adding a scooter, adding a, a bike town trip, um, adding uh, an Uber and other modes with their transit trip. And then that other tab uh, it, on the previous screen, Jeff. Oh, this is perfect. Thank you. That's a good example. Uh, and then the final tab on that uh, info window there, uh, routes for those who are who know um, they know about a certain route and they want to explore more and learn more doing their pre-research as to where a route goes. Um, you can do that research here and see the route on the map as well as any real-time vehicles along that route. So again, this is uh, this is kind of a starting point in two ways. We're building that foundation and a platform for future growth for future initiatives that should um, help us achieve our goals and serve customers better. Um, but also this is, again, as I said, a, a, a beta test. So in a way, we're, we're, this is starting the conversation with riders, starting the conversation with stakeholders and getting um, some good feedback already and looking for additional feedback as we, as we uh, continue to refine this prototype um, and eventually launch it to the public to replace the existing TriMet.org. But uh, that's that's an overview of our progress so far. We're happy to be getting some really positive feedback from riders so far, along with some really great suggestions for improvements for future features, uh, both from employees and riders. Thank you for your time and look forward to any feedback you have on the beta site. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. So JC, um, Dave, thank you. Very impressive. Um, I want to just thank both of you and then everyone involved uh, from the IT and marketing divisions who's really making this improved customer experience come to life. So with time restraints, we're going to go ahead and move forward to the next presentation. Uh, next, I would like to ask manager of service performance and analysis, Miles Crumley, to present a quarterly performance report. Miles. Good morning, Board President, Board of Directors. Uh, my name is Miles Crumley. I'm the uh, Manager of Service Performance and Analysis here at TriMet. I'll be presenting the 2020 fourth quarter quarterly report. Uh, in this pre uh, report, we continue to maintain safe operating and a safe operating environment for customers and staff in the face of a pandemic, civil unrest, wildfires, and a sustained 60% decline in ridership. Through all of that, Max bus and west on-time performance was above 90%. Our rail rule violations have continued to decline and our bus collision rate remains at one of the lowest in the past five years. Next slide, please. Uh, so this chart here shows uh, bus and max on-time performance. Um, from the last time that we were here, the uh, on-time performance for bus was right around 86.8. Uh, Currently, it's at 94.4%. And Max is holding steady right around 90%. Uh, we are continuing to emphasize leaving the yard on time, and the decreased amount of traffic due to the COVID-19 pandemic has led to increased bus on-time performance. Next slide, please. Uh, West on-time performance continues to grow um, from 93.9% um, from last year to 98.3%. And with the introduction of positive train control, we've experienced fewer delays um, from the prior year. Next slide, please. Uh, fixed route operator complaints. Um, we did see a spike in complaints at the start of the pandemic, but the number has fallen back to uh, where it was roughly a year ago. Um, so previously we were at 11.5 complaints uh, per 100,000 boardings, and now we're looking at 13. Next slide. Uh, for Max, we're seeing uh, more or less in the data world, we would call that hump between 1.8 and 2.1 flat. So we are seeing more or less a flat number of complaints per 100,000 boardings on uh, max. Next slide, please. Rail rule violations continue to fall. Uh, we have fewer new operators in the most recent months, and our OCC rail control has um, now has safety announcements that go out for the rail controllers to assist them as they operate their vehicles. Um, so between last year and uh, quarter three of 2020, the rate has fallen from 66.1 per 1 million miles to 47.3. Next slide, please. Lift miles between road calls uh, continues uh, to show good performance overall. 
Uh, previously last year, we were at 67, we'll call that 68,000 miles between road calls, and now we're at 57,000 between road calls. Uh, while this may indicate that the vehicles are less reliable, we've had to rely on older vehicles due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The older vehicles that we have allow for more capacity, which increases the distance between the operator of the vehicle and our customers. Next slide, please. The fixed route bus uh, mean distance between failure has increased um, from previous. Previously, we were at 8,000 uh, miles between road calls. Now we're about 11,600. Uh, we've had fewer failures related to the engine and body frame, and uh, we're continuing to work on um, fixing those body frame issues, such as doors, bell cords, and operator seats. So body frame issues are more of a customer comfort type area. Next slide, please. Uh, for max uh, main distance between flight failure, again, in the data world, we call that roughly flat. It's uh, previously was 11,221, now it's at 11,516. And so we're pretty pleased with that rate so far. Next slide. Uh, fixed route bus collisions per 100,000 miles. We have seen a slight increase um, from where we were in quarter two 2020, which um, was right at the heart of the pandemic. Uh, we are starting to see that rate increase. However, uh, we have had an influx of newer operators. And so we at some point would expect this to level off. Next slide, please. Uh, max collisions, uh, we've seen an increase from 1.02 to 1.32 collisions per 100,000 miles. Because of how much service we operate on max, this jump from 1.02 to 1.32, while on the chart looks very large, it's actually pretty small because of the infrequent number of collisions that occur on the actual max system. So again, we would call that flat. Next, please. And those are all the slides. Are there any questions regarding the quarterly performance report? Miles, as the board think about questions, I just want to thank you and your team for all of the hard work. Uh, also want to thank the operations employees. These last 30 days here, we've dealt with what PGE has called the worst snowstorm in the last 40 years. Dealt with snow and ice, the pandemic, and also doing a lot of good state of good repair incredible efforts that are going on by our employees. So, so thank you. Uh, Mr. President, are there any questions on the quarterly presentation? I, I see I, Keith and Ozzy's hands still up. I don't know whether that's from the last one or if they have comments now. Uh, this is Ozzy. I'll, I'll bring my hand down, but we'll take the opportunity to echo the, the gratitude. Um, General Manager DeSue, I really appreciate your work. I know that you were doing a lot on the operations side throughout that uh, record setting uh, winter storm. Um, and certainly just from the user's perspective, um, it, it was wild out there. So, you know, having to address passenger safety and logistics um, in those conditions, I just want to thank you, thank the, the staff, thank the operators. I can only imagine the amount of patience and safe and then, you know, customer service um, that had to take place in those moments. So I know that that's when um, I think TriMet's best shine. So thank you so much to everyone out there that helped navigate that in the best way possible. Uh, so I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you. I want to echo, those, uh, echo um, Director Gonzalez's remarks as well. I won't elaborate, but um, it's certainly a, a yeoman's job that's been done um, by TriMet during these certainly difficult times at best. Uh, my hand should have been down, but um, hopefully it's down now. Thank it you. is. <laughs> okay. Thank, thank you both uh, very much. And I will definitely pass the information to staff. Finally, I would like to ask Director Alan Leto to bring us up to speed on the business plan. Alan. Yes, thank yes. you. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, I will be as brief as I can, uh, though this is an important mm. milestone for the business mm. plan mm. Uh, as I am presenting the, the final version. Um, and that was of course included in your, um, 
your packet. What I want to do is just give you a little context and a little highlight uh, overview, um, and that that should do it. Um, for context, of course, the business plan is a strategic plan that we do for a five year look ahead. So this one is for FY22 through FY26, but we update every year because circumstances keep changing, especially in the last year or two. Uh, it lays out our goals, objectives, measures, targets, and key strategic actions. Um, and it embodies our vision, mission, and values. Our mission to connect people with valued mobility options that are safe, convenient, reliable, accessible, and welcoming for all. And our values of safety, inclusivity, equity, community, and teamwork. Um, as you know, this, this will trigger at the beginning of the fiscal year, uh, which is July 1st. Uh, the draft, this is the final, but the draft has been out since January. I presented it to the board in January. It's been available to the public. I've um, talked with TIAC and CAT and done a special uh, session with CAT, gathered comments, um, and, <clears throat> excuse me, we the reason we do this on this schedule is because we present the final business plan at the same time that we present the proposed budget so that the development of each are in tandem so that the strategic efforts of the business plan are informing the budget and the the needs and capacities of the budget are informing the development of the business plan the draft of course is still on the website for the public but this final will be posted very soon this has been a year of challenges and accomplishments, and hopefully the next year, obviously we'll have challenges, but hopefully we'll have accomplishments as well. Very briefly, of course, you just saw with our ridership reports, COVID-19 has had a big impact on just about everything we've done, our operations, our um, travel demand, and on the economic prospects of many of our riders. We'll be working on, we're already working on, we will continue to work on how to build back ridership. And that's a, a big theme within the, the business plan. Um, even knowing that commute patterns have changed for some permanently perhaps, uh, and doing things like recognizing the demand and the growth in demand and the changes and how to balance capital projects and our operating service in, in response to that and also doing very important work like implementing the reimagined safety and security efforts mm -hmm. in ways that are welcoming for all. Mm -hmm. uh, to accomplishments, we had 72% of the measures that are still on target despite some of the disappointments in ridership and some of the other things that are directly impacted by COVID. We've still uh, managed to hit target or do better than on a number of those measures. And there are 26 key strategic actions that have been accomplished. You'll see those as green check marks within the business plan. Uh, there are also, in addition, over 80 statements of progress and update on our efforts. So even things where you don't see a green check mark, we've managed to accomplish substantial uh, uh, mo motions forward on these a lot of these key strategic actions towards our goals. And uh, these challenges and opportunities ref are reflected in our strategic priorities and the points of emphasis that the board discussed earlier in the fall and the winter and helped guide the development of that has focus on the ridership and customer experience, as you've seen, the reinventing of safety and security, equity and a culture of safety, and especially equity and inclusion, uh, both for our own employees and of course for our riders and customers. Uh, and then financial resiliency and maintaining our system given all of the challenges that we're facing. The business plan itself has an updated description of our engagement activities, uh, including how we do so under the constraints of the COVID-19 pandemic that really has to force us to change the ways we reach out. And also our use of the best information and science available to address the cleaning and operations protocols and everything else that we had to do in response to COVID-19. We've updated the key strategic actions and the timing 
and updating the format so that it's easier to follow and easier for us to focus and be clear because that is after all the, the purpose of the business plan to help the agency as a whole 3000 employees all head in the same strategic direction that is well informed by the board guided by the the general manager and the executive team and um, has a role for just about every TriMet employee. Behind this plan, which you don't see, is that each key strategic action has an assigned responsible and an assigned accountable member of the TriMet team. And I'll be working with them over the year to make sure that we are making progress and we're updating as needed. So to wrap things up, the business plan here, I present the final um, for uh, uh, FY 2022, which begins July 1st of 21 and extends to June 30th of 22. Uh, happy to pre present this and deliver this result of review from dozens and dozens of TriMet employees, the executive team, all of you, uh, CAT and TIAC, and uh, comments from the public. With that, thank you. Uh, thank you, Alan. Any any questions, President Warner, for the board? I'm seeing uh, Director Edwards, you have raised your hand, it looks like. I don't have any questions. I've had an opportunity, and I want to thank Alan for the job that he's done as well. Um, he's actually met with folks, and I had an opportunity to meet with him as well for some issues and questions that I had. And I want to thank him for that, because I know he has a busy schedule, and he had a, a, a huge task to to put all this together, but it's very comprehensive. It's very thoughtful. And I wanna thank him for the work that he's done and in, in, um, in presenting that and also in bringing it to completion. So thank you very much, Alan. Thank you, Director Edwards. Alan, just, um, I appreciate your diligence as well in keeping us true to our overall business plan. Thank, thank you very much for that. Thank you, Sam. Okay, President Warren, I just have two quick points I wanna make. I wanna go back and just visit the ATU update very quickly and just let you know that, and the board know, that a negotiated outcome is the best outcome. And it is our hope to continue to work with the ATU to constructively come to an agreement. We've got ongoing talks scheduled and we're hopeful, again, that we can come to consensus as we move forward. Uh, the next area I want to just point out to you as well is that, as you stated earlier, we are proud to report the beginning of April 1st that the Multnomah County Sheriff Office will take command of TriMet's Transit Police. And, and the point that I want to really bring to light as well, it's, it, it's my pleasure to express my appreciation for all of the hard work to our staff. I want to call Mueller Blag out just as well, John Gardner. Tom Markroff, Eric Van Hagen, and there's so many others that work behind the scenes to have a hand into this process and to actually move us to approval. There's some folks that I really want to call their, their name out just as well from the public. Um, I would also like to thank Jan Campbell and Claudia Robinson and Mara White and Mayor Steve Callaway for their testifying to ensure we have a safe and welcoming system for all. President Warner, I appreciate your help and leadership through all of this. And I just wanna extend a big thank you to everyone who made this a reality. With that said, that concludes <laughs> my report for this morning. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, General Manager. Any further comments or questions for the General Manager? I'm hearing none. How's the board I, doing? I, uh, I just wanted to... <laughs> Um, give kudos to our um, interim general manager as well. He's done a great job stepping in um, and not knowing that that was going to be his responsibility currently, um, in addition to his CEO responsibility. So thank you very much, Sam, for the work that you're doing also. Appreciate it. All right. So I know that a number of us, at least three of us, have been at this since 8 o'clock. Um, do we need to take a, a quick five-minute break uh, or should we just forge ahead here? I I'm not seeing anybody break. Yes or thumbs up or thumbs down. I'm not. Thumbs up for a break. Okay, let's take five minute break. Uh, let's come back 1125 or so. 
and uh, then we can get right into the consent agenda and, and the and the resolutions. So five minutes. Let's come back. Let's say eleven twenty six, if that's possible. Wasn't that fun dealing with the union? Bruce, Bruce you're, you're, not on Bruce, you're, not, uh, you're on speaker. You're not on mute. You need to mute your mic, Bruce. And Roland? Yes, sir. Your your mic was muted. You were you both had your mics on. I just opened mine up to tell him he was um he had a hot mic.
All right, is the uh, board starting to filter back here? See that uh, Director Way needs to take off about noon, and I myself, uh, Director Way, need to be out about 11:50. So we'll have to move through here, or we'll have a less than a full board to take on action on some of the items. Hola, gentlemen. All right. Well, I think most of us are back here. I'm going to start getting in on the on agenda again. Um, I'm going to move to the consent agenda. And for uh, Director Lewis's benefit, the consent agenda, as in many boards, is a is a, a things on this agenda are considered to be routine and may be approved by the board in one blanket motion. However, any board member may remove an item from the consent agenda for a discussion or question by requesting such action prior to consideration of this portion of the agenda. And on the consent agenda today, we only have two issues. Number one is the approval of the board minutes for February 24th, 2021. And I hope we all had a chance to review those. And then the second item, uh, Director Lewis, is we're, re we're gonna uh, have a resolution directing that the ordinances be read by title only. This saves us from hearing the general manager read about two hours worth of stuff from the uh, from the ordinance, <laughs> and you have the ordinance in your uh, in your packets today. So, with that, is there any item on the consent agenda that any board member wishes to have removed? I'm hearing none. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda as uh, as presented? So moved. Second, this is Lori. So it was Linda and Lori, is that what I heard? All right. Any further discussion on the consent agenda? Hearing none, then let's call the question. All those in favor of the motion to approve the consent agenda, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion is approved unanimously. Thank you very much. Let's move on into our resolutions. The first resolution is resolution 21-03-09, which is approving the general manager position description, job description, excuse me. Um, and we've had a lot of discussion about that already today. Uh, Director Bauman, did you have anything else you wanted to add to this uh, before we uh, I'll ask for a, mo a motion? Uh, no, nothing else to add. Um, thank you for for considering this and it's it's the product of a lot of work by the search committee and this really starts the process this is our formal start by adopting this so um it, is there a motion to approve resolution 21-03-09 so moved I have a motion is there a second 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 by director way any further discussion on this agenda item or the position description I want to simply say thank you to the community at large, all of the individuals that called in, wrote in, that sent in surveys, that participated in the forums. I want to thank the board members that helped us in the listening sessions as well, to the staff for helping us orchestrate listening sessions and making it easy for <laughs> board members to step in and participate. Um, when uh, Director Bauman says, you know, this is a, the, the results of a large effort, um, it is no joke. Um, as far as all the ears that have been put around the community to bring this together. And, um, you know, we, we feel, I feel comfortable in, in saying this helps bring a clearer picture to what we're looking for and um, hopefully will help us um, get closer to finding them. Thank you. Thank you. Director Edwards, is your is your hand up again? No, 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 it's not okay. up. I was just waiting to um to vote aye. All right. Well, <laughs> I'm gonna go to that. So unless there's further comments, I'm gonna call the question. All those in favor of the motion to approve resolution 21-03-09, please signify by saying aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion is approved unanimously. Congratulations to the committee and thank you again for your hard work on this. This was a, a lot of work and I don't think people understand how many hours went into what you've got in front of you today, so thanks. <laughs> All right, so before we go to the next resolution, I am going to uh, have to uh, convene the TriMet board as the TriMet budget committee. This is uh, something that's in our, uh, our bylaws and I think in state law. And so we can now consider this agenda item, which is uh, resolution 21-03-10, which is approving the proposed fiscal year 2022 annual budget for submission to the Multnomah County Tax Supervising and Conservation Commission, TSCC as we lo lovingly call it. Uh, Mr. General Manager, uh, do you or your staff have a, any uh, further input on this item? Uh, yes, President Warner and members of the board, as you know, as part of the annual budgeting process, Oregon law requires TriMet to obtain board approval for the budget, the proposed budget before you. And it is submitted to the Multnomah County Tax Supervisor and Conservation Commission or the TSCC for their review in advance of the public hearing next month. Once analyzed and approved by the TSCC following the public hearing, the budget is returned to the board for consideration and approval. The resolution before you now outlines TriMet's proposed budget for fiscal year 2022, which begins July 1st, 2021, and runs through June 30th, 2022. It's a $1.64 billion proposal, and it includes $733.7 million for operations, including $54 million for OPEB, other post employment benefits and 126.5 million for debt service and 301.2 million for capital and operating projects. Under this budget, TriMet will continue critical capital maintenance projects and service improvements based on demand. And as our customers come back, the budget does not include a base fare increase for the ninth straight year. Those who have trouble paying full fare can apply for our low income fare program, which is also found in the budget. There are currently about 24,000 active members in the program who have unlimited access to the system for $28 a month. The deadline for submission on the proposed budget to the TSCC is this Friday, just two days away. And your approval of the resolution is recommended. D. Brookshire, our CFO, is here to answer any questions that you may have about this process or proposed budget before you. Thank you. Do we have any questions or comments of either Sam or uh, our chief financial officer on this item? I'm hearing none. Yes. Is there a motion to approve resolution 21 03 10? So moved, Linda. And who who was the second? I'm sorry, I didn't hear a second. Uh, it was Lori and Linda. Uh, oh, Lori uh, and Linda. Well, this is Lori. I'll second. <laughs> okay, very good. So we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion on this item? Yeah, I had a yeah. Oh, I had, had a, a, I had a, uh, Thank you, thank you. Yes, I was. Just trying to look through the document to find my question. I, I appreciate it. Um, this ha this is uh, just a, I wasn't clear on one piece of it. Um, and this is granted, I don't sit on the finance committee, so I don't get to see uh, a lot of the, the sort of the process, uh, the, the baking process as it were. And it was just about the um, issuance of bonds and I wasn't clear there's an anticipated bond issuance built into the budget, but I, I didn't know if that was um, essentially already planned for and if there was another step in the process of review from the board before that would be issued or, or does approval of this now essentially constitute it? It will happen at some point and it's already baked in. So I just didn't know if that was a maybe or <clears throat> It's a done deal. Sure. Uh, good question, uh, Director Gonzalez. 
So uh, you would have an opportunity to approve uh, any bond issuance that's done. We put this into the budget so that if the market determines that it's uh, advantageous for us to issue, we will. If you recall, uh, some months ago, you did approve a, a plan for us to issue bonds for the red, Better Red project in fiscal year 20. We haven't done that yet because the cash flow requirements don't say are not saying that we need it yet. And we're trying to push it to fiscal year 22 if possible. But it's uh, it's in the budget now so that we can take advantage of it. It doesn't mean we have to do it. And you certainly will have a chance to to review and approve before it goes further. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and this is uh, not so much a question. I just want to kind of point this out and I don't know where in the process to do so. Um, the during the business plan presentation, there was, um, you know, some some talk about alignment with the budgeting process and how there's a parallel process between the business plan and the budgeting so that they reconcile one another. Um, and I just want to flag this for for the public and for the board is something that I believe is uh, a place where we can look a little deeper moving forward. It, it does have budget implications um, and in, in the budget plan so far. It stood out to me as an area for improvement. So I simply want to point out in the financial policies that we have, we have some strategic financial policies um, that really provide some guardrails for performance. And I know that we address them in, you know, how much contingency to build in, um, how how to sort of build an unrestricted fund balance um, uh, timeline that helps us protect ourselves. And there's some very specific numbers um, around those strategic policies. When we get to fair policy, um, I feel like there's a, a lack of, of specificity or guardrails that, that we can build from to have a conversation about what fair policy could look like um, in addressing the concerns that we and we have from a budgetary side and that the community has from you know a customer service and access side. So um, I, I'd love to see, though there's no constraint on my side, I can live with our plan as we have. I want to be clear. I, I see areas for improvement, and I think we as the board should look at the fair policy built into the strategic financial policies more closely to really see if we can get the agency some guardrails to strive for. Um, right now, you know, we're not proposing any changes to the fairs. But we also know that we haven't fully answered what the fair policy should look like so that we're, you know, continuing to reconcile ourselves. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there and I'll stop. I, th I thank you for the time. Sure, you're speaking about the strategic financial plan guidelines and there is a section in there on fair revenue, but the fair policies are something that are subject to review every year. I'm happy to take a deeper look at that and consult with folks and public affairs and other parts of the area of the organization. See if we can get some more specificity into that. Sounds like a separate board item, separate from the budget though. Yeah, I think this Thank is you. a good one to talk about maybe uh, after we get through the GM uh, selection process to, to see if we can uh, have somebody help a, an effort there. Because I've, I've often had that same feeling for the last nine years, Ozzy. So I think your your point is really well taken. Thank you, President Warner. Mm -hmm. Further comments or questions? Uh, Linda. Bruce. Mm -hmm. Director Simmons, please ahead. Yeah. Um, uh, to, to also add to that, within the business plan is a plan for a overall review of the fair structure. So that that currently resides within the business plan. All right, I'm uh, feeling like uh, ready to call for a vote here. All right, all yep. those in favor of the motion to approve resolution 21-03-10, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion is approved unanimously. Thank you very much. With that, I'm going to adjourn the TriMet Budget Committee and reconvene as the TriMet Board of Directors for the next resolution, which is uh, resolution 21-03-11, uh, uh, 
<clears throat> which is uh, authorizing modification to a contract with WST USA Inc. for design services for the division transit project. Mr. General Manager. Thank you, President Warner and board. Uh, this resolution before you now requests a contract modification with WSP USA for design services for the division transit project. Construction of the division transit project is well underway and is currently estimated at about 40% completion with the opening of the new high, high capacity bus service between downtown Portland and Gresham. It's on track to begin in the fall of 2022. That leaves about 18 more months of construction. The work is complex due in part to the nature of Division Street, which has underground utilities that must be carefully navigated. This has led to a number of unforeseen design changes and exceptions. As a result, the project has exhausted the existing design budget faster than anticipated. The project team worked with WSP to develop a budget for the remainder of the project. Under this resolution, the, the contract authority would increase by $1.7 million to just under $12 million. The design costs are considered fair and reasonable, and they will be covered by the project's available grant-based contingency. In its proposal, WSP estimated would use certified subcontractors for 20% of the work and has thus far achieved 26.5% DBE participation. Your approval is recommended. Steve Witter is available for any questions. All right. Thank you, Mr. General Manager. Does the board or have any questions for Sam or for uh, Steve? Seeing none, is there a motion to approve resolution 21-03-11? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none then, I'm gonna call the question. All those in favor of the motion to approve resolution 21-03-11, please signify by saying aye. 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 Oh, yeah. Opposed? Hearing none, the motion is approved unanimously. Thank okay. you very much. Moving on then, the next resolution is uh, resolution 21-3, uh, uh, there should be 03-12, uh, I believe, right? 03-12, authorizing an amendment to an intergovernmental agreement, an IGA with the City of Portland streetcar operations. Mr. General Manager. Thanks, uh, President Warner. TriMet and the City of Portland enjoy a unique relationship with Portland Streetcar. TriMet is responsible for operations and maintenance. The services are provided under the overall direction of the city and not TriMet. The resolution before you would execute amendment number 12 to the inter intergovernmental agreement with the City of Portland for streetcar operations. Essentially, what that does is authorize TriMet's share of funding for the Portland streetcar for fiscal year 2022. The number, the total amount is about $8.874 million and was established by the Streetcar Permanent Executive Group or PEG and includes TriMet executives, directors, and managers, PBOT streetcar managers, and the executive director of the Portland streetcar. It takes into account TriMet's share of costs for funding personnel and other service for day-to-day -day operations of the streetcar. And it follows the guidance outlined in the, in the streetcar master agreement, which was adopted in 2012. I ask for your approval. Brett Rogers and Nancy Young Oliver is available to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. General Manager. Questions by the board on this uh, kind of continuation of our long standing agreement with the city. Yes, I have a question. Perfect. The, it, it's more of just a historical trend. I see um, the essentially um, annual contract has uh, kind of been pretty level. Um, has the how has the pandemic um, shifted operations at the streetcar, or in, in what way has have resources sort of shifted? And that's. Uh, um, just to help me understand that, we know certainly it's affected us in, across the agency. Have you had layoffs or changes in operations? 
those yeah. are the kinds of questions. Okay. Uh, good morning, President Warner and uh, Director of the Board. Um, some of the changes mainly have occurred around COVID-19 and cleaning. Uh, we haven't laid anybody off within Streetcar, and those are our employees. Service is down, but it's only down about 10%, so we are still continuing with service. The ridership is actually increasing downtown because of the density of downtown. And so basically the operations is, is pretty much flat, staying the same. We did forecast um, less service next year, but just, just um, a little bit. So everything is pretty much going to stay flat as it stands right now. And we're working with streetcar, trying to follow the same policies and guidelines around COVID-19 and the CARES Act. Thank you. You're muted, President Warner. Thank you. Um, I, I'm saying that answered your question, I hear. So uh, is there any further questions by the board on this uh, resolution? I'm not seeing other, any. <clears throat> is there then a uh, motion to approve resolution 21-03-12? So moved, Linda. Is there a second? Second, Laverne. Laverne, thank you. All right, so is there any further discussion on this item? If not, I'm going to call the question then. All those in favor of the motion to approve resolution number 21-03-12, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion is approved unanimously. Um, I'm going to start this next resolution, but uh, I'm going to turn the meeting over to uh, Director uh, Bauman because I have to leave here in just about a moment. So the next resolution is resolution 21-03-13, which is authorizing a contract with Ortiz and Associates Inc. for Lafayette Pedestrian Bridge Maintenance and Repair Services. Mr. General Manager. Thank you, President Warner, and hope you have a great day. Um, now we turn to the Lafayette Pedestrian Bridge. This is a structure that's not far from the TriMet Center Street headquarters on 17th Avenue. It was built as part of the Max Orange Line project and provides safe access for pedestrians and people using mobility devices to cross the above the heavy railroad tracks at Brooklyn Yard. It is especially popular with school kids in the area. The bridge was designed with lots of glass, security cameras, elevators, and other amenities with safety in mind. Um, with all of these factors at play, TriMet de determined that an outside contractor would be instrumental in the ongoing maintenance and upkeep of the bridge. For this contract, we've selected Ortiz and Associates through an invitation to bid process. The contract covers a five-year term and comes in just over $1.3 million. It is a task order based and the cost is included in the facilities maintenance operating budget. As far as diversity, Ortiz workforce is 66.6% .6 minority and 16.6% .6 women. The company has identified four DBE firms for subcontract work. I ask you for your approval. Both Karen Powell and Roland Hoskins is available for any questions. Thank you. Okay, has, has Bruce has dropped off, is that right? That's correct. Uh, I believe so. Uh, okay, and, are there any I'm questions? Sorry. sorry, Director Bauman, I will also be leaving at noon. Okay, thank you. We'll still we'll still have a quorum, I believe. We'll, um, but we may get through the resolutions before you need to go. Um, so, are there any questions for staff regarding this resolution? Yeah, I, I had a question. I didn't find if um, Ortiz and Associates, the recommended vendor, is are themselves um, certified uh, minority or women owned or veteran owned. Are they? Uh Thank you, Director Gonzalez. They are not as a firm individually certified, although you see from their numbers, uh, they should qualify. And the district has worked closely with Ortiz on over a number of contracts for uh, quite some time now and continue to encourage them to work with our very able uh, business partners uh, in our equity group to see if they can pursue registration. Thank you. I certainly echoed the sentiment of the agency if Ortiz and Associates 
qualifies, I, I would love to see them be able to pursue that certification in addition again, to the subcontracting. Thank you. And again, this is not my area of expertise, but it does seem to me that they would be a, a viable candidate for that qualification. And on that basis, we do continue to encourage them to pursue it. Thank you. Great. Any other questions? Uh, can I hear a motion to approve resolution 21-03-13? So moved. Second. Yes. Wait second. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any discussion of this resolution? Hearing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor of uh, resolution 21-03-13, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The resolution passes. I want everyone to know I'm doing this without a script. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, thank you. Next order of business is resolution 21-03-14, authorizing a contract modification with North Coast Electric Company to provide LED lighting fixtures and controls at various TriMet facilities, Mr. General Manager. Thanks, Director Bauman um, and board. This is the last resolution before you today uh, to request a modification to the contract with North Coast Electric Company. This is a company that has been providing extensive LED lighting upgrades to TriMet facilities. Those upgrades are in response to a fire inspection that found existing lighting fixtures at TriMet facilities were no longer code compliant and beyond their useful life. That inspection was done in June of last year. Fast forward to last December, you may recall approving a resolution for a contract modification to continue lighting retrofits at several additional TriMet facilities. Those repairs are well underway and nearing completion. Now, what's unique about this contract is that it was procured with a special process authorizing the state of Oregon known as a piggyback procurement. And it gave TriMet the opportunity to take advantage of a competitively bid unit pricing for the lighting fixture and controls. This program is administered through the Energy Trust of Oregon, and the agency has agreed to extend incentive programs to allow TriMet to complete additional projects at a much lower cost. We have identified two additional facilities where lighting upgrades are critical, and those are the Robinson Tunnel Bores and the Gateway Park and Ride. The resolution before you would increase the contract amount for North Coast by just under $349,000 to complete these projects. The cost is included in the maintenance division's FY21 to 22 operating budget. A note on diversity. North Coast workforce is 13.5% minority and 17.4% female. And I ask for your approval. Again, Karen Powell and Roland Hoskins is available for any questions. Thank you. All right, any questions from the board? No Director questions. Irish Byman. Oh, I beg your pardon. Yes. I didn't Go mean ahead, to interrupt please. you. This is Karen Powell. Uh, in the absence of questions, if I may, I would just like to share a brief uh, financial update on the first four locations. Uh, may I do so? Yes, please. Thank you. I'm very happy to report uh, that we have fully replaced all of the high bay lights in our garages and rail yards. And uh, it came in even more financially advantageous to TriMet than we had initially calculated. Uh, the calculations are very complex for these projects and are revisited several times throughout the process so they can fluctuate. Uh, and I'm very happy to report that for our first four locations, Center Garage and Yard, Ruby Main, South, Yard, and the five outbuildings at Ruby, the Merlot Garage at Yard, and uh, the Elmo Garage and Yard are coming in at a total cost to TriMet of less than $685,000. And that total cost of, it's actually 6836 dollars uh, is offset by over a million dollars in incentive and rebate funds from the Energy Trust of Oregon. So we are just thrilled to be able to 
move forward TriMet's uh, safety initiatives because these lights are significantly enhancing safety in these locations, as well as supporting TriMet's climate action goals. So it has been a very successful program for us, and we thank you for allowing us to uh, move forward with it before and your consideration of continuing. Thank you. It's a it's clearly a win win at a, a good price to try met uh, pursuing yes. those goals. Indeed. I don't know if you can Any, see my hand raised. I actually, oh, Keith, I, I do now. Yes, <laughs> you have a question. Okay. Thank you. I, I more of a kind of a question comment. Do we, um, track the savings that we have because uh, LED lighting versus the uh, previous lighting system and how much that is saving so that the public has a better understanding of of um, the reasons for this. You know, I know the reasons are, you know, code related as well, but also yeah. the huge savings that um, and the life of the life expectancy of the new um, uh, systems that are being installed. Oh, thank you for that question, Director Edwards. It is very material to this conversation. And in fact, we have been working with our partners in the finance and accounting division uh, on devising a method to track the savings. At the moment, the savings for all of those locations is forecast at about $330,000 a year. There is a little bit of complexity to, tr to tracking the savings uh, on into the future. And that is the result of the fact that there are many different pieces of equipment that are uh, powered from the same meter, from the same utility account. So at the same time that we're reducing our consumption with these efficient fixtures, we're also adding consumption when we upgrade, when we add new equipment, uh, pull in uh, new outlets, et cetera. So there's a little bit of art and a little bit of science to it. Uh, and we are focusing on that right now to see how we can best accomplish that. All right, any other questions? Uh, Ozzy here, uh, just uh, wanted to add, um, uh, a, a short perspective on the fact that we are uh, un unleashing a great story here, and you know it'll make it a home run. We're creating green jobs now. We're moving towards climate responsive and safety enhanced strategies. This is fantastic. Um, I encourage the vendors that are part of this to take advantage of any subcontracting opportunities and hiring opportunities to ensure that the future of green jobs in our region are um, diverse and representative and are bringing up folks from all communities. So thank you for the, the work and, and thank you to our staff um, uh, um, for being part of this and helping communicate the value proposition. Thank you, Director Gonzalez. And uh, we certainly will continue to encourage our vendors and our suppliers to strengthen their uh, ties with our disadvantaged business communities. It is an important goal for us all. All right, if there are no further questions, I'll um, invite a motion to approve resolution 21-03-14. So moved. Laverne second. Uh, second. All right, any, any discussion? And all those in favor of resolution 21-03-14, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? And any abstentions? The resolution passes. And that is the end of the uh, resolutions for today. Uh, next on the agenda is the first read reading of the ordinance. And Ms. Devine, can you walk me through, <laughs> walk us through that? <laughs> uh, uh, yes, I, I was hoping that it would be up on the, I can pull it up, but I was hoping it would be up on the screen to read. Hold on one second. Sorry. <laughs> there, Jeff's starting to share. Thank you, Jeff. I, I have it on my phone too. Okay, ordinance number 363 of the Tri-County Metropolitan Transportation District of Oregon, adopting service changes and updating route designations. This is the first reading and public hearing. So I believe the next step is to convene a public hearing on this ordinance. There's not a vote today. Uh, is there anyone uh, signed in to testify at the public hearing? 
Uh, we have one person who signed up. Let me get him pulled up in there. And I believe we have a second as well. All right. So I'm going to start you. with uh, Dan McFarling. Laura, are we doing three minutes for this? Let's yes, let's do let's do three minutes. Okay. Thank you. All right. So Dan, I've just unmuted your microphone. Can you Hi. give us the sound check? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm getting. Oh, hold on. If I turn off my my uh, speaker, That's much hopefully better. you can hear me. I won't be able to hear you, but I'll turn it back on as soon as I'm done testifying. Uh, if you hear me, would you please nod your head? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Primate's job is moving people. The task of transit is not to move vehicles from point A to point B. Proposed changes focus on movement of vehicles. Changes to number 75 and 77 disconnect buses from the Hollywood Transit Center. It requires people transferring between bus and light rail to walk longer distances. It requires people, including those with mobility issues, to cross busy streets. Changes to Line 19, a route I frequently rode in the 1960s, abandons transit-dependent neighborhoods on Southeast Rex and 32nd Avenue. While my postgraduate education and career were in public health, I have been advocating for effective transportation policy since high school, traveling to three continents to experience efficient transportation systems that serve people. The stops proposed for abandonment on line 19 attract significant ridership. The new route is faster, but it follows a chain link fence adjacent Eastmoreland golf course. TriMet passenger count will drop, it will serve fewer people. A lower score might be desirable in golf, but public transit is not golf. We need leadership who understand transit. Please vote down Ordinance 363. If you are unsure, table the motion until you understand the score. Do not adopt these poorly planned changes. Your job is to serve the people of Portland. I would like to add a footnote if my time is not out and it appears it is not. When Doug Kelsey was quoted in the media as saying transit ridership is not a key measurement of transit performance, my jaw dropped. Transit ridership is one of the most important measurements of appropriate performance. I hope the TriMet board will work to increase ridership and service to people. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, we have another uh, member of the public to testify. Yes, uh, next up is Heather McCrary. Heather, you are unmuted. Great, thank you. I'm Heather McCrary. I'm the Executive Director of Explore Washington Park, and I'm here to state my support of the Line 63 route changes before you today. We're a nonprofit that connects people to the culture, diversity, and really the wonder of nature in Portland's signature park. And we do this by providing free shuttle service that links the Washington Park Max Station to the entire park. And for those of you who don't know, the park is 400 acres and the Max Station is located in the southwest portion of the park, which is about two miles away from the other end. So our free shuttle connects riders to all the park venues, and that includes Hoyt Arboretum, the International Rose Test Garden, both of which are free, as well as the Portland Japanese Garden. We also provide a free shuttle service to offsite parking lots when the main lots fill. And before COVID, between these two free shuttles, we provided around 150,000 rides annually. We also provide pre trip information and on site visitor service staff. Our efforts at Explore Washington Park have helped create a 56% increase in the percent of people using transit to get to the park between 2014 and 2019. And we've always had a really strong partnership with TriMet, with JC Venata serving on our board, who's been wonderful. We believe the proposed route change in front of you today would better serve tourists who are staying downtown who want to visit Portland's iconic park and the gardens in it. It also serves people who are living on the east side who currently have to transfer to a max line and then again to a bus in the park to access the gardens. This would allow them to make one transfer at the transit mall for direct access. 
We have attended the Arlington Heights Neighborhood Association meetings, and they also have a representative who serves on our board, and they have expressed some concerns about reduction in service. To address some of these concerns, we've agreed to run the Washington Park free shuttle seven days a week year round. It's currently seasoning, se excuse me, currently seasonal and to fully cover that cost. We also agree to serve stops in the neighborhood with our free shuttle. Our free shuttle frequency is 30 minutes in the winter months and about 10 minutes in the summer months. So I truly appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today, and we always appreciate the strong partnership with TriMet. Thank you uh, for your testimony. Are there any other, there any other members, members of the public, of the public uh, ready to testify, Jeff? Yes, uh, next up is Brett Horner. Brett, Brett. go ahead. Brett, you are off mute. Okay, Brett, we're not getting any audio. Um, let uh, send me a message in the chat if you're able to get that worked out. Um, Jim Howell was up next. Okay, can you hear hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I uh, want to uh, uh, agree with those who, who want to see this uh, ordinance uh, not 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 taking it, especially uh, the. Uh, I'm going to focus on the line, uh, the line 66, 75, and 77 in the Hollywood District and also how it relates to the uh, transit-oriented development of the Hollywood uh, Transit Center. Uh, moving the transit out of the transit center uh, and calling the new project the transit hub is uh, somewhat cynical. Uh, anyone that transfers at that station, and by the way, that station is the sixth busiest station in the TriMet max system and there's about seven thousand people a day that board or deboard trains and buses at the hollywood transit center and to require those people to make those transfers cross a five lane busy highway halsey in order to and and, and travel another block to uh access uh the uh the stairs going up to the uh, uh, light rail is uh, intolerable. I, I've, I've used that station for 35 years, and if I have to do that, I'm going to quit using <laughs> Max because it's just uh, absolutely tenable, and you're going to lose a lot of passengers uh, by causing this disruption. And the other thing is the 77 line, which uh, by taking it off of Broadway, you're moving that line away from uh, uh, the uh, Ho Hollywood East, which is a, a high rise senior center for disabled and making them walk a block and a half to Halsey Street, cross five lane Halsey Street, catch the bus, which currently stops right at the front door today. And this in order to save one minute of running time is uh, not very smart considering the fact that it's about a, it's on the 77, which is a, at least 15 mile long route. So uh, one minute is going to not make that much difference. So please eliminate line 66, line 75 and line 77 from the ordinance if you do pass it. There are other things in the ordinance, but it looks like I'm running out of time, so I'll stop there. <clears throat> All right, thank you, Jim. Uh, Brett Horner, can we get Brett back on? Brett, your mic is unmuted. Hmm. 
Brett, if you are there, um, you can go ahead. Okay, looks okay. like it's not working out still. So. Yeah. Um, we can try one more time at the end, but I'm going to move on to Ian McKenzie. Ian? Uh, hi, uh, good morning. My name is Ian McKenzie. I live on Southeast Belmont Street and I'm a regular rider of Line 15. I'm here in support of the proposal to reroute the bus onto Southwest Alder Street in downtown. In non pandemic times, I take Line 15 to get to and from my job in downtown Portland. I also use it to get to and from the apartment of my boyfriend, who lives in Northwest. I'm not saying that we're dating each other just because there's a direct bus line between our homes, but it definitely doesn't hurt. When I take the bus to work, I get off at the Southwest 5th and Washington stop in downtown. I then have about a five minute walk to the office. In the evenings, I leave and walk straight out of the office onto Southwest Salmon Street. And so the proposal to move the bus off Southwest Salmon Street is going to be a little less convenient for me at the end of the day. However, I support this proposal because I know that running the eastbound bus on Southwest Salmon Street is a much less direct route through downtown than running on Southwest Alder Street would be. Every time I take the bus from my boyfriend's back to mine, I wonder why on earth the bus is taking this meandering route with lots of turns, which delay travel between northwest and southeast. And I think this is an important thing to consider. Transit has to be used, useful to and from downtown, of course, but it also has to be useful for getting between different neighborhoods. These kind of journeys are harder to serve by transit, and so when you have opportunities like this to make them a little bit easier, you should take them. My understanding is that one of the reasons this common sense rerouting hasn't already been done is because Alder Street does see a lot of traffic in the evening peaks. I also understand that TriMet is partnering with Peabot to add bus lanes on Alder to address this issue. That's the kind of partnership I want to see more of in the future, and I thank everybody at both agencies for their collaboration here. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. All right, I'm going to try Brett one last time. Brett, if you are there, you can go ahead and speak. I might, I might suggest, uh, Brett, because of these technical difficulties, we'd be happy to hear, see your testimony in written form. Um, please feel free to send an email. Uh, to the board. Is, are there, is there anyone else ready to testify? Um, that is it. All right, we, I understand that there is a staff presentation regarding this ordinance. So we'll uh, turn it over to uh, the staff for that right now. Thank, Thank you, you, Director Bauman. Let me, let me introduce this here. Um, I want to bring in uh, Director of Mobility Planning and Policy, Tom Mills, to provide us some detail to the proposal, and also Carl Green, um, who will give us an update with uh, Title VI. Tom? Thank you, Sam, and thank you, Director Bauman and the rest of the board uh, today for having us to speak about the FY22 proposed service changes. Uh, Jeff, if we could move to the next slide. Many of you, uh, oh, uh, these are the slides for the um, the Title VI uh, analysis. Apologies. Carl Green will be presenting. Give me uh, one moment, I, and I will get yours. Sure, no problem. Uh, as the, those of you who've been on the board for the last so many years uh, have probably been used to seeing uh, uh, these presentations in which we're adding service, uh, but because of COVID. Uh, we have not been able to add service. Uh, we did not add service in FY21. And for this proposal, we are not adding service, but we are looking to make changes uh, in regards to efficiency, uh, trying to make the service uh, operate more efficiently, faster for our customers. Uh, and what that oftentimes means is uh, eliminating uh, deviations that uh, take uh, you know, customers out of direction and uh, add travel time uh, to their trip. Uh, thank you, uh, Jeff. So uh, again, this proposal is cost neutral uh, because uh, of the revenue uh, decrease due to COVID uh, and uh, focused on service efficiencies that we believe will attract rider riders, uh, safety improvements, and other no-cost uh, service improvements. Uh, 
Uh, with that, let's go ahead and jump right into the um, the proposal itself. Uh, Jeff, if we could, yeah, thank you. And what I have here, I have the lines uh, listed in numerically, except I've moved the 15 to the very end because one, it's the most complicated, and two, it's the line that we've received the most letters and emails about. Uh, so I thought we'd talk about that last. Um, first, we're looking at a portion of line 11, which serves the Rivergate area. And as you can see, there's a tail there on the line that goes up to Rivergate uh, Boulevard and Ramsey Street. Uh, this tail takes uh, about eight minutes to go back and forth. Uh, during pre-COVID, we uh, did about eight round trips per day on this, and we were only uh, getting a handful of boardings and alightings. Um, and so next slide, we would like to propose that we remove that tail. Um, the ridership on that has uh, decreased even more so uh, during COVID, and the um, the one of the companies uh, that was driving the ridership um, has had severe layoffs. Uh, so we don't really want to inconvenience our customers uh, any further to have them uh, just go out and back and not pick or drop off anybody along the way. Uh, in the next slide, please. The next slide is line 19. Uh, we've heard a little bit about uh, this from our commentators. Uh, this actually encompasses two changes. Uh, the line 19 uh, typically uh, serves uh, Milwaukee and Bybee Street. And then uh, oftentimes it does one of two things. It either deviates and serves uh, Union Manor, uh, which is a senior uh, facility, uh, or it goes beyond there and uh, deviates and uh, goes along 28th Rex and 32nd Avenue. We like to refer to this as the Rex loop. Uh, both of these uh, deviations really don't generate significant ridership at all. Um, and again, we are inconveniencing a lot of customers who are already on uh, board. Uh, we wanna make their trip faster. So uh, we have reached out to Union Manor, we've spoken with them, uh, and we've come to an agreement that um, uh, we think that hourly service between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m., seven days a week would be appropriate. Um, however, for the Rex loop, we really want to focus that on where the rides actually tend to occur and those do tend to be uh, during the peak hours. So we are recommending 2 a.m. Uh, peak trips and 2 p.m. peak trips. The next slide. The next uh, route is line 32. This uh, serves Oregon City. Um, and this is a route uh, where you can see there we go to Beaver Creek and Highway 213 uh, and then to Clackamas Community College. Uh, today, uh, after we uh, turn onto Highway 213, we, we don't have any more stops. So we're just deadheading to Clackamas Community College and then dropping off and picking up students there. Uh, if we can go to the next slide and show our proposal, since we wouldn't miss any stops, uh, what we would like to do is have the line go down to Oregon City High School uh, and serve the high school, uh, go along Myers Road, uh, which has recently been extended to Clackamas Community College. Uh, and so we would be accessing Clackamas Community College now from the south. Uh, and we would not be impacting any riders. It does add about a minute of travel time for our customers. Next slide. And the next change we have here uh, is on line 39, which serves Lewis and Clark College. Uh, you know, we like to have our layovers at the end of the line, but in this case, there's no place for us to do that at the Lewis and Clark graduate school of education. And what happens is we have to turn the bus around in a very narrow parking lot uh, and then go back up to that other loop where we lay over. Um, however, we really don't get many riders uh, at the Lewis and Clark uh, graduate school. And in fact, what happens is uh, we tend to drop uh, people off, uh, but then nobody gets on there, or not very few people get on there because they know they would have to wait through a layover at the Northern Loop. So what they do is they walk up uh, to the Northern Loop from the, the college. And so if we go to the next slide, uh, you would see, yeah, that's what we would do now. We would just do that loop uh, and students could walk to the graduate school uh, through the campus, by the way. Uh, and the next slide, we have just a few more left. Uh, okay, this is line 63 Washington Park. We heard about earlier. Uh, thank you to Heather McCary from Explore Washington Park uh, for speaking on behalf of this. This idea actually came from Explore Washington Park. 
Uh, they recognized that we were duplicating service within the park. This is what we do today. Uh, we are the blue line and they operate the, the pink and white line there. Uh, and if we go to the next slide, uh, what we are proposing to do is uh, rather than duplicate service, uh, we would be responsible for uh, bringing people from downtown to the park uh, by the bus, or of course, we know we, we also serve them via Max to the Oregon Zoo. And then Explore Washington Park would serve, uh, would circulate through the park. Uh, as Heather mentioned, uh, during the busiest times of the year, they operate 10 minute service uh, and they are free of charge. Uh, so uh, they are very popular, more popular than our service. Um, and this way it allows us to maximize. Uh, just uh, in reference to some of the comments about the Arlington Heights neighborhood, uh, we, we too are concerned about them uh, and, and getting students to school and people to work. Uh, I would note that um, about half the ridership uh, in that um, Arlington Heights neighborhood, uh, the, the stop, about half the ridership gets on and off at a bus stop that is just around the corner from where uh, the, the new route would operate uh, by the Japanese garden so uh, and the Rose Test Garden. So uh, many of those riders would uh, just walk a, you know, a very short uh, distance uh, to access uh, the bus. Next slide, please. Just a couple more here. Uh, this one you've also heard a bit about. This is uh, uh, the Hollywood Transit Center. As uh, you know, uh, the Hollywood Transit Center uh, is being prepared for uh, a new development um, with affordable housing. Um, this would require uh, TriMet to uh, vacate the Hollywood Center Transit Center, uh, and we would uh, stop on street. We are working with uh, the developers to design uh, bus pullouts uh, along the Hollywood Transit Center uh, in the eastbound direction uh, that would allow for us to uh, operators to uh, dwell for time if they're running uh, early. Uh, if we could go to the next slide and show our proposal. You'll notice also uh, the blue line, line 77, we are proposing that that bus line um, not go to Broadway. Uh, again, that is a deviation uh, that takes customers out of direction. Uh, it, it does serve, uh, as uh, Jim Howell mentioned, the Hollywood East uh, uh, apartment uh, complex. Uh, but as uh, Jim also mentioned, it is about a block and a half walk uh, from Hollywood East to uh, Halsey Street, which we believe is a reasonable walk for people, um, even for uh, seniors and uh, people in mobility devices. Uh, we believe that. Uh, that can be done as they are probably walking that distance uh, at the other end of their trip as well. Uh, okay, the next slide, please. This will be our final uh, line. Uh, this is lines 93 and 94 that uh, run between, well, 93 runs between Sherwood and Tigard, and 94 runs between uh, Sherwood and downtown Portland. So they duplicate each other. And uh, what we would like to do, uh, Jeff, the next slide, please, is just merge them into one line. Uh, every trip would go into downtown. Uh, the line 93 and 94 run local service between Sherwood and Tigard. Uh, and then between Tigard and downtown, the 94 would, uh, it, today is an express service into downtown between Tigard and Portland. Uh, so it would continue to do that. Uh, it would just uh, have a few extra trips because we would be merging the 93 with it. Uh, with this, we've also uh, surveyed other riders because the weekend service uh, is a little bit different. Uh, the service uh, would remain the same on the weekend. Uh, and the next slide, please. Okay, so now we get into the 15. Uh, and the 15 is complicated, uh, so uh, feel free to ask questions. Uh, there are really two major proposals with line 15. Uh, the first uh, proposal uh, is with downtown, which our last speaker uh, mentioned. Uh, if we can see the next slide, as you see, the, the westbound direction is separated from the eastbound direction in downtown by five blocks. So if you get off on Washington, you have to walk five, depending on where you get off, you have to walk uh, five blocks to catch uh, the bus going in the other direction at the end of the day. Typically, you want to have uh, this kind of couplet only one block apart. Uh, the next slide, please. And so that is what we are proposing. We are proposing 
to make these uh, the the eastbound direction only be one block apart from the westbound direction. As mentioned in the comments, uh, we are working with the city of Portland to uh, put in bus lanes along Alder Street to allow our buses to get through the traffic uh, and access the Morrison Bridge uh, quicker. Uh, next slide. And the impact of that does mean that for people who live or work along Salmon, they will have to walk uh, up to Alder to catch the bus in eastbound direction. However, they're already walking that distance at least for one leg of their trip. Uh, they're walking the, the five block distance. Uh, so uh, it is, we believe that uh, it is appropriate to uh, make this change. And then now is the last uh, set of slides. If we can switch, there we go. Uh, so this is the proposal you've probably heard the most about, uh, at least in terms of emails and letters. Uh, this is also on line 15. Uh, this is up in Northwest Portland. Uh, what's interesting about this line is it has three tails. Uh, the first tail goes up to uh, the Northwest Industrial Strip District, uh, Northwest Guion Street. The second tail goes to uh, Montgomery Park. And the third tail goes to the Thurman Street uh, leg. And that's what I, the proposal focuses on here. Uh, the Thurman Street leg um, has been in operation since TriMet has uh, been in existence, actually before TriMet has been in existence. However, one of the problems we have is that uh, when we get to the end of the line, we can't turn the bus around. Uh, we actually operate a three-point turn in this direction. Uh, this is against our uh, standard operating procedures and really against uh, best industry practices. Um, additionally, uh, west of uh, 29th Avenue, uh, the ridership is quite low. Uh, we go up 35 times a day, so up and down, 30, so round trip 35 times a day, uh, and we uh, pick up less than one person per trip. So what we would like to propose, uh, next slide please, is that the Thurman segment, all those trips that currently go to the Thurman segment would still go up Northwest 23rd, uh, but then they would uh, hold their layover at uh, Wilson Street. Now, the reason we don't send them to Montgomery Park is because it's full. We can't fit any more buses in there, but we do have space uh, at that Wilson Street area. And then next slide, we would propose replacing the Thurman Street uh, segment with a new bus line. We'll call that line 26. That's what we call it in, in the ordinance uh, that we're asking you to approve. And uh, we would operate this line uh, from Gordon Street with a smaller bus, a 30 foot bus. This would allow us to do a U-turn and we wouldn't have to make a three-point turn. I should point out, uh, over the last 10 years, new homes have been uh, built in the area where we're making the three-point turn. And though we don't have it on video, we don't uh, have eyewitnesses, we know that uh, mailboxes have been struck, a telephone has been, pole has been struck, even our own uh, bus stop sign has been struck. And again, we don't have video of us doing it, but uh, we may be the culprit. Uh, with a 30 foot bus, we can uh, conduct a U-turn and we wouldn't uh, have that problem. Uh, we do recommend uh, going to 18th and 19th because that is a growing district within Northwest and we wouldn't be reducing service on Northwest 23rd Street. However, because of the low ridership and because so much of Thurman, the Thurman segment is within close proximity of Vaughn Street and 23rd Street, we recommend just focusing on the trips that uh, have the highest ridership. And that would be two trips in the morning and two trips in the afternoon peak. If we can go to the next slide. So what that means is if you kind of look everywhere at, at the purple box, uh, that purple box is a, a quarter mile walk distance from the existing uh, line 15, uh, the red line there. Uh, so uh, people living in that area would still be able to access the line 15. And that is about 85% of the ons and offs on Thurman Street today. The other 15% uh, are further up the hill and uh, would have to rely on line 26. And as I mentioned, most of those boardings and alightings take place uh, in the, well, the highest riding, ridership or highest boarding number of boardings and alightings take place in the peaks. And that's where we would uh, propose focusing of the service. Next slide, please. I know that was a lot. Um, I'll be I'll just talk real quickly about um, the outreach. 
Uh, we did two rounds of outreach uh, in the fall and the winter. Uh, our outreach is focused online. Um, we also send postcards to all the homes and businesses within a quarter mile of affected routes for each of those outreach processes. We held three open house meetings, uh, two in English and one in Spanish. As I mentioned, an onboard survey, we've spoken to neighborhood associations and uh, the, the different advisory committees. Uh, next slide, please. We've also reached out to uh, community-based organizations. Uh, we've provided information to them uh, and we have confirmed that they have forwarded that information uh, to their, um, their clientele. Um, you know, with, with COVID, we typically will contract with one or more community-based, or excuse me, pre-COVID, we would contract with more uh, than one community-based organization um, and have open house meetings in person. Uh, we haven't been able to do that, but they have been very kind in, in forwarding our information to their membership. Uh, and the next slide, please. And with that outreach, uh, I won't go through everything, but uh, you can see that it, it's a, a mixed bag. Um, there, uh, you know, some of the lines where you, you've seen uh, letters and uh, emails in opposition uh, really are, are more mixed than maybe what you have seen. Uh, oftentimes when people support something, they don't, uh, they don't write a, a letter to the board. Um, and there is some neutral uh, support. I will point out the union manner of 100% support. That was after we uh, worked with the management at Union Manor to, uh, to revise the proposal. Um, so with that in mind, I'd like to turn uh, the, the presentation over to Carl Green. And, and I do wanna address one thing that came up during the public comment, uh, and, and it, it was accurate. We made a mistake with our board memo um, or ordinance memo. Uh, we, you know, we were running drafts back and forth uh, between several of us and uh, the drafts got mixed up. And the portion that talks about the Title VI report is from an old, uh, an old ordinance. Um, we actually, during this meeting, we have gone ahead and we have replaced that information with the accurate information that Carl uh, will be uh, speaking about in, here in a minute. But I do wanna stress the ordinance itself is accurate. It was just the board memo that was inaccurate and we will make sure that uh, the memo will be, you, you will have a revised memo uh, by the second meeting. Carl? Thank you, Tom. Fellow direct, Director Bauman, fellow board of directors, thank you and good afternoon. Jeff, could you go to the next slide, please? So the Civil Rights Act of 1964 provides the legal footing to ensure agencies are upholding the assurances under Title VI. The Federal Transit Administration provides a Title VI circular, which gives the, the guidance and the policy directives to ensure that transit agency, and in this case, particularly TriMet, to ensure that we are not creating inequitable impacts for minority and, and low income populations. So with that being said, the Title VI circular requires that TriMet prepare and submit an equity analysis before the TriMet board to be made aware, consider, and approve of this service equity analysis. Next slide. So the graph before you provides a conceptual overview of the Title VI service equity analysis. So moving from left to right, you will see that the first component of the equity analysis is to determine whether or not a service change meets the major service change threshold. In the event that it does, you can see the decision tree saying, yes, if it does, then TriMet is required to evaluate the possible impacts. And what we're evaluating is per our board adopted Title VI program, there is two policies within that. There is the disparate impact policy and the disproportionate burden. Both of these policies provides the thresholds and the methodology to assess whether or not there is a disparate impact. And if there is, moving to that last column where we must evaluate alternatives in order to avoid, minimize, or mitigate any of those said adverse impacts. So bottom line is if there's any impacts, we will need to change course or address it. Next slide, please. So based off of 
the presentation that Tom previously mentioned, there was a number of service changes made or that is being proposed rather for the FY22 service proposal. Based off the analysis and using the major service change threshold, there were a number of lines that met that threshold. And the lines before you here, which I'll read off, the Northwest Thurman Street, the line 15, the line 19, the line 32, the line 63, and the line 93. These are all the lines that met the major service change thresholds. The other lines, although they had changes made to them or are being proposed, they do not constitute a major service change, so they are not included in this analysis. Next slide, please. What I'm what this is communicating or what this slide is communicating is to demonstrate that there are different types of analyses for each different for each major service change. So there's major service increases, there's major service reductions, and then there is also major service other major service changes. As far as this anal equity analysis goes, there were three ser major service increases and three major service reductions. Next slide. So as I mentioned earlier, TriMet's disparate impact and disproportionate burden policies have established thresholds to evaluate these possible impacts. And the type of analysis that's prescribed within our program is applied at the line level and also at the system level analysis. Next slide. What this graph here is to demonstrate the testing for a disparate impact at the single line level. So what it's important to note is what we're looking at here is for each individual line, we are looking at the service area population using the census data around that particular route, assessing the change of that route and comparing it to the service district average. So for the TriMet service district average for people of color or minority, it's 30%. But by way of to account for a margin of error, we also apply a three, per, three percentage points to that threshold. So as you can see on the screen before you on, on the slide, that there is a red, red dotted line which indicates the threshold. So what we're doing in that, in that second bar of this graph, if there, since it's a service, if there are service reductions, if the minority or low income population is above that threshold, this is indicating that those populations are receiving more of the burden. And given that there we're also seeing service increases, if it's below the minority population or low income population is below that threshold, then that may see, that indicates that they're receiving a receiving less of the benefit. So the point to be made is that we conduct this analysis at the line level to assess individual impacts for each individual service change that met the major service change threshold. And if it does create an adverse impact or potential adverse impact, we flag it for further analysis. And then also, we also, as I mentioned earlier, we look at this at the, at the system level analysis, which will be demonstrated on the next slide, please. So as I mentioned, the testing for disparate impact at the system level, it's slightly different from the line level where it's taking into account all of the reductions and all of the service increases combined in order to assess the, the network or the system level impact of the proposed changes in totality. So the threshold that's applied here is what was approved by the board as part of our 2016 and 2019 Title VI program is applying or the application of a 20% rule or, for, or the 20% threshold for the four fifths rule. So difference in comparison to the line level where you're comparing the service area for a particular line against the service district average, what you're looking at here between the blue bar graph or the blue bar and the orange bar is you're looking at the percentage of non-minority population impacted. First, you get as a baseline, you assess that. And then from there, you also look at the impact, whether it's an increase or decrease for the percentage of the minority or low-income population as a whole. 
And as you, the disparity range, so if you go, if you look up to where it says major service reduction, if it's over that 20% above the non-minority level, then that indicates that minority populations are receiving more of the burden. So from a conceptual basis, this, these previous two slides is just to set the tone of the type of analysis that we, that we do. And in finer detail in the board report, pages seven through 14 will detail the line level analysis and page 15 through 18 will give an overview and more detailed level on the system wide level analysis. But for time's sake, I'll go over the system level in the next couple slides. Next slide, please. So again, as I mentioned before, there are two different types of analysis in this. The for service improvements or increases and for service reductions or decreases. I'll first start with the improvements. So the main takeaway here from this table is although there is a slightly lower percentage, so 1.8% is, which is the third column of this table. So although a slightly lower percentage of the district's minority population will be positively impacted, per our Title VI policy, the findings do not result in a disparate impact. If you look at the, the second column where it, it states minority population disparate impact threshold, it's less than 6%. So the minority population would have to be below that 1.6% to show a finding, but because 1.8% is well, or it has a couple of percentage points above or percents above that 1.6%, then it's not a disparate impact finding. So that is basically saying we're, we're good to go on that front as far as for the service improvements for minority populations. So next slide, please. So similarly, we also looked at this, uh, looked at the impact with regards to low income population. So a great, in this case, a greater percentage of the district's low income population will be positively impacted. And again, this does not result in a disproportionate burden because the positive impacts for minority population exceeds that of higher income populations. Next slide. So now as we look at the, the opposite, as we're looking at the service reductions, similar findings as in the sense of where we can, where shows that a lower percentage of the district's minority population will be negatively impacted. So per the Title VI policy, the findings do not result in a disparate impact. So as you can see, the threshold is more than 1.34, but you can see that the negative impacts 0.53% is less than that threshold and also less than what the non-minority population, the, the negative impact in comparison to, to that population. So this is showing that minority populations stand to receive less of the burden of the service reductions. Next slide. And similar to the previous slide for the disproportionate burden, which is looking at low income population in comparison to higher income, a lower percentage of the low income populations will be negatively impacted. And per our policy, it does not result in a disproportionate burden. Next slide. So the, the analysis is very, it's, it's a data centric approach and, and it, it takes the better half of, of a few weeks working with service planners and, and we're having a number of different conversations. But as I, as I look at the overall report and the equity analysis, this, this, is, a, this is a good, good report and it's favorable for Title VI protected populations. So I'll go ahead and read off some of the, the analysis conclusions which is important for the board of directors to note is that there are no system level disparate impact or disproportionate burden for the major for the three major service increases or the three major service decreases. Second, all improvements are on lines in service areas with below average minority populations, but it must must be said that two of the three improvements will expand the service area for minority populations. Thus this would not indicate a potential impact for minority populations after the further after we further examined the changes. And then lastly, all improvements are on lines and areas with the average or above low income populations. And as I mentioned earlier, as a result, a greater share of the region's low income populations stand to benefit as compared to higher income populations. So with that being said, 
the results of the service equity analysis does not require a modification of the proposed changes. Next slide. So at this point in time, this just outlines the next steps as far as what, what you have before you. Tom wonderfully went over the FY22 service proposal and I followed up with the service equity analysis. That's part of our process. And in addition to receiving the public hearing and the, and the public, in, public involvement and community engagement, it now sets the stage for the board again to that you've been made aware and you considered and you and you work and you move to approve of the equity analysis. And then from there, I believe that is done at the second board reading on April 28th. Now I'll open up the floor for any questions. All right. <clears throat> any questions from the board? I I've, I've got something. Okay, um, go ahead, Ozzy and then Keith. Thank you. Um I appreciate all the work from the staff and presenting all of this information. Um, clearly, it's a batch of of activities, and it's kind of hard to to parse out, um, you know, where where the focus needs to be. But I want to point out for the board and the public that there's some special concerns I want to bring up right now. And I know we're in the first reading here. Um, so I want to make sure you're aware of them up front. Um, clearly, we've all as the board received a lot of letters um, specific to the, the few lines. I want to point out the most the most information we've received happened to be in within the district two jurisdiction. Um, and so I feel especially uh, obligated to um, bring to you all of the sentiments that are coming from the community that I'm hearing and. Um, I got to say, you know, in this time of, of post pandemic, as we're trying to build up our ridership again, I'm a little bit nervous about changes to the context in general, just because, you know, we're, we're trying to get people refamiliarized with a system. So, you know, I'm not sure what that does in the ridership equation. Um, I, but what makes me more nervous and, and really, uh, uh, hard to stomach is the reductions in service. And I know there's a few areas where. There's some re overall reduction to the service in addition to some changes. So the reductions are where I, I'm hearing a lot of, of stomach ache from the community. And I'm, I, I want to make sure that the agency is um, really responsive to those concerns coming from the community, especially around the 15 line 15 and um, the connection to that other new smaller um, vehicle service. Um, I really, uh, I think there they're getting the double whammy. It's a change of context and a change of service, um, and it's an overall reduction. Um, so I really think we should look deeply at addressing those concerns. I'm not sure this is the time to be reducing service. I know ridership is used as part one of the one of the arguments here, but um, we're also trying to increase ridership. So tailoring ourselves to low ridership doesn't always get us there. Um, so I'd like to um, really beseech the staff to get, to sharpen their pencils on this and come back with some alternative service proposals that are addressing the, the reduction in service primarily in that area. I think it's an important one. And I think in addition to that, I want to make sure that in, in the other area around the, the Arlington Heights, Washington Park line, line 63, that we are properly coordinating with our partners um, in the, at the Washington Park shuttle. It sounds to me like there's a clear conversation that started. What it's not clear yet is how that conversation will continue because we're now moving into interdependence. And so we have uh, the potential for changes in service coming from the shuttle, or I'm not sure when service begins or how we're coordinating the, the timing of stops, but certainly those ongoing conversations need to make sure that we're bringing that shuttle community or, or that shuttle service to the rigor that we would apply to changes in service. So we should be a partner in that. Um, so I'm concerned that uh, that I don't see enough of that. So maybe it's just it hasn't it hasn't really that work hasn't been brought to light, but I want to make sure we're coordinating with them. And of course, the Japanese garden, who is now going to be a, a potential core anchor uh, uh, anchor resident in the 15 line. So. Um, you know, I, I appreciate that you've brought us a batch of stuff. It's, there's so much to respond to, but I got to say, um, 
it, there's a little bit of, of stomach ache about the reduction in service. District 2 has high density and, and we're trying to bring ridership back. So please make sure we're coordinating properly with those partners um, like anchor tenants uh, as well as those other service partners so that we're addressing um, the biggest concerns of community. I think as, as one of our public forum comments came, um, we got to focus on the, the people moving. I think that's really key. So please take that back to your desks and I'd love to see um, some coordinated effort with those partners and a service or, or an alternative service proposal with better service than we're currently seeing in that line 15. That's a major ding. Do. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you for your comments, uh, Director. We'll we'll definitely take them back and and talk with staff about the the points that you've made today. Uh, Keith, do you want to go ahead? Thank you, thank you, Director Bauman. I um, echo some of Ozzy's concerns. Um, Director Gonzalez has brought some issues uh, forward that um, certainly I'm uh, concerned about as well. I appreciate um, the presentation today. It's a lot to digest. Um, however, I I still do have some questions, and and I know it's hard sometimes to um, to uh, break it down to um, these individual concerns or or the or the smaller um, you know the the ground level issues that 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 we come up against when we have our, our constituents that express their issues and concerns, but. I, I wanted to ask Carl, um, uh, what is a minority under the um, under the Title IX? Um, um, I'd like to know what that definition is. Um, I also had a question regarding um, Line Eleven, and does that is that the Wapato site that um, that that loops it toward the end? And I'd like to know um, what the demographics look like in regard to line 39 in the Hollywood district, because we're, we're talking about uh, folks that um, have a, um, have to commute, you know, have to get on the ground from one point to another point to continue um, being serviced. And I'd like to know if we have folks that are, um, um, when we look at those demographics, or do we have some folks with disabilities that are having to get um, from those points? And, and I have a hard time um, justifying um, um, a um, a challenge in, in getting from point A to point B on one end just because they have to get from point A to point B on the other end of their um, of their commute. Um, that that doesn't justify it for me. I'm sorry, um, but because um, it's it sometimes it's bad enough. It's like it's it's almost like the old adage, you know, when folks say I had to walk up 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 the hill both ways um, to get to where I had to get to, and and I don't think that's um that's a fair analysis when we say that uh, someone has to they already have to walk on the other end, so it's not going to hurt them to walk on this end as well. So I think that you know we have to go back, like um, Director Gonzalez say said, and and reconsider uh, some of the. Um, um, decision making that we have in regards to um, these uh, particular lines, and even though they may not meet the threshold of major um, under the um, under the guidelines, I think we still have to remember that we're we're servicing people, and and um, um, just because there you know there may be a few people that are riding or less people that are riding today because of COVID, that we don't um, that that may not that may change um, going forward. And so, if we start taking services away, then um, certainly our ridership is going to go down and, and may not come back. So, I think that's something that has to be considered as well. Thank you. And I, I apologize. I'm going to have to leave in about five minutes. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Linda, I think you had your hand raised. I wanted to give Carl an opportunity. Do you have the definition of what is a minority for uh, Keith? Yes, thank you, Director Simmons. The definition by way of the Federal Tran Transit Administration, the circular, is all race and ethnicities other than non-white, non-Hispanic whites. Thank you. Is that helpful, Keith? Thank you. Thank that that is helpful, but 
I I get concerned because there are other um, um, quote unquote uh, minority populations um, that um, have to be served as well, such as those with disabilities. Um, uh, there may be physical disabilities or other disabilities, and I think we, you know, that that should be considered as well. Okay, okay Lori, um, I ask to speak, and one of the things I want to bring to the rest of the board's attention is this is our last time to see Carl Green, because Carl has uh, accepted a position with a transit agency in Denver. And I just want to go on record of thanking him for what he has done to develop our response and analysis to Title VI. Um, you're going to be greatly missed. Um, it feels like, from my perspective, your time with us has been very short. Uh, Denver obviously attracted you uh, for maybe more reasons than the, just the job. Um, they have more snow, by the way. Um, but you are going to be missed, and I'm just grateful for the contribution that you made here while you were here. And they're definitely um, gaining a tremendous asset. So thank you, Carl. Thank you. And a little less oxygen, so take oh, some with yeah. you. Oh, that too, that too. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and, from, and, I'll, from us. and yeah. I'll just share before I go as well. Um, thank you very much, Carl. I noticed that you didn't let me know that you're leaving because you're trying to sneak out because I wouldn't have let you go. So <laughs> we, we already know that. But, but the work that you've done has been, I really appreciate it because it's so comprehensive and, and so detailed. And it helps give us um, a, a really good look at, at um, all the issues that we have to be concerned about in making these decisions. So. Thank you again for that, but um, I'm not happy to hear that you're leaving. So I hope it works out well for you or or selfishly, I'll say, I hope it works out bad and you come back. Well, <laughs> and and I, I want to extend one more thing here in recognizing Carl through your work and, and I want to thank you for it as well. Through your work, you have actually helped establish a strong program uh, here in oh. TriMet. Um, you've done a great job with setting up the analysis and the, and how it informs policy, um, but the training and the advocacy uh, have, have put seeds in the ground, I think, that are gonna help foster uh, a great culture, um, clearly makes this something that's top of mind throughout decision-making. So, you know, uh, thank you. Beyond, beyond you yourself, what you leave behind here at TriMet is, is certainly something we, we hope to hold up. So, uh, I wish you all the best, uh, certainly uh, at Denver, and um, you know, just keep looking back over here with us. Make sure we're holding true to what you have helped us build. Yes, we're I, as I understand it, our our uh, our standards around equitable service are more stringent than the law requires. So that's right. Um, that's that's a a great mark in our favor. Uh, Linda, did you have something else? You're muted. <laughs> I, I just wanted to also say, if I can, thank you all for the for the sentiments and the comments. And I'd be remiss if I wouldn't say that for the board's leadership and and TriMet in general, being able to work across the agency at the division and department level. It's although I was managing or administering the program, it was a, a testament of the, the staff at TriMet and their commitment to transit equity and just knowing that we have a, a great board in order to lead us in that direction to make sure that we are ensuring that we're distributing service, we're making different changes with top of mind that transit equity and Title VI protected populations are on the forefront of our decisions because on the backs of many when we're thinking about the Civil Rights Act of 1964. That's what gives me the passion. So I love being able to leave TriMet in a good place. So thank you all. Thank you. <clears throat> you know, Keith, uh, Keith has to leave. It's one o'clock. I, I had a question, but I think maybe I'll just send it by email to, to Tom Mills um, because this has been a long, uh, a long day. So um, I guess I would ask the board if you have other questions, why don't we uh, why don't we do it uh, through staff? Um, 
through direct contact if you don't object. Uh, is there any other, Mr. General Manager, is there any other business for the board? There's no other business and no other comments. Just want to thank everybody for participating today. Okay, thank you. In that case, uh, we are adjourned. Thank you. Hooray. Goodbye, everyone.